Okay, the clerk has confirmed we have quorum. We'll get started. Good morning. <laughs> Always wanted to do that. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Deputy Mayor Jennifer McAlvey. I'm the chair of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. We have quorum, so I call meeting 12 to order. Welcome, everyone. Today's meeting is being held by video conference and in person at City Hall in Committee Room 1. The meeting is also being live streamed online at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. I will wait to give the land acknowledgement until the room's quieted. Thank you. Although we are meeting in different locations today, the Infrastructure and Environment Committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. If you're registered to speak at today's meeting, Please listen for me to call your name. I will call speakers in the order they appear on the list. The list of speakers can be viewed online by visiting the Infrastructure and Environment Committee link at toronto.ca slash council and clicking on the speakers box for today's meeting. Members, the city clerk has provided all agenda materials on toronto.ca slash council and on CMP, the clerk's meeting portal. Clerk's IT staff are available to help members if you need help with your devices. And I want to remind you to please submit and approve your motions by email. Staff are available at IEC at toronto.ca to help with motions. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? No. Seeing none, uh, may I have a motion to confirm the minutes of the meeting on February 27, 2024? Deputy Mayor Cole, all those in favor, all those opposed, that carries. I also want to acknowledge we have some guests today with us. We are joined today by students from Humber College Business School Lakeshore Campus, which is in Deputy Mayor Morley's ward. And they are studying for the Public Administration Ontario Graduate Certificate. And they are visiting City Hall today with their professor, who is a former City of Toronto Councillor, David Hutchin. Um, welcome. Okay, we'll now proceed with the agenda rundown. Item IE 12.1, post-transition of the Blue Box program to extended producer responsibility and results of District 2 service delivery options review. I will hold, we have speakers on this item. IE 12.2, organics processing facilities update. I will hold as we have speakers on this item. IE 12.3, Toronto's climate change readiness updates on commitments and a refreshed mandate for coordinating resilience activities. I'll hold, we have speakers on that item. IE 12.4, Cycling Network Plan 2024, Cycling Infrastructure Installation Second Quarter Update and Missing Sidewalk Program 2024, Local Road Sidewalk Installations. I will hold as we have speakers on this item. IE 12.5, Under the Gardner Realm Public Plan. I'll hold, we have speakers on this item. IE 12.6, 55 to 65 Broadway Avenue, construction staging area, time extension. Uh, do we have any, uh, there's no speakers. Does I'll anybody have it. any questions? Councilor Pastorak is moving. All those in favor, all those opposed, that item carries. IE 12.7, major snow event response plan. I'll hold, we have a speaker on that item. We have two new items to introduce. We have one item to introduce. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor Morley, you have an item to introduce. Do you want to introduce the item and then we'll hold it to give people time to read it and release it later? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, um, the clerks have it there. Um, this is with, with relation to a specific area in my ward for the cycling network plan. We've been working closely with staff and local residents on some appropriate upgrades to the design there. Um, this is time sensitive as some couple work that is coupled is already underway. So um, hopefully colleagues can take a peek at it. And I know there'll be a couple of residents who would also like to speak to this item. Uh, so look forward to their comments as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All those in favor of introducing the item. 
All those opposed, that item carries. Okay, that brings us to 12.1, post-transition of the Blue Box program to extended producer responsibility, results of District 2 service delivery options. Just checking on the speaker's registration. We have two speakers registered. Our first speaker is Aleem Kanji. Good morning, uh, Deputy Mayor, members of council. Just to be clear, uh, when I made the registration, I made the registration for uh, Mr. Dom uh, Majuri and Ted Avalis from QP Local 416. Um, with your indulgence, we can turn the podium to them. Thank you. So, do you want us to do the next speaker and then come back to you? Is that possible? Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Um, uh, Sarah Buchanan. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah from Toronto Environmental Alliance. Uh, and I'm actually, I'm not usually the one at T who's up here talking to you about garbage and waste collection, uh, generally it's, it's Emily, but I want to assure you that I have a long family history with garbage and waste. Uh, my mother actually wrote her master's thesis on landfills, so uh, she'd be very proud of me today. Um, and my son is now taking up a long tradition uh, of the family and also of three-year-old boys by being obsessed with garbage, and which is why I actually brought this waste management guide with me today. Uh, my son recently went on a vacation and we asked him to pack a bag with all of the toys that he wanted to bring on his vacation. And it's a little kid's backpack, doesn't fit much, but he chose three items for this bag. One, uh, he chose some little plastic diggers, he chose some trains, and he chose Toronto's waste management guide. And much to my pride and, and shock, I guess. Um, and so this might not be what you expect um, him to choose or, or most children to choose, um, but he, uh, I, I was very proud of him. And I, I wanted to, to make this point because um, this waste management guide is actually one of the education pieces that the city uh, provides that really, really works. And part of that is because, uh, you know, some children look at it and talk to their parents about it, but it also gets into a lot of people's homes and helps give them proper information about what to put where, what goes in the blue box, what goes in the green bin, things like that. That's an incredibly important tool and one of the cheapest tools we have uh, for diverting waste from landfills. But, now that the city has uh, you know, essentially been bullied into a situation where they have to privatize blue box services, we may not be getting as many of these pieces. We hope we will, but it's, it's unsure. Um, and due to weaknesses in the provincial regulations, private producers who are now taking over responsibility for the blue box system will only be required to do one education push per year in French and English while the city currently provides multiple pieces in, I believe, 18 different languages. This will no doubt have an impact on what people put where, uh, and it'll mean more things going into landfills that shouldn't, uh, which is expensive, which is messy, which is bad for the environment uh, and climate change. Uh, and also, my son needs more uh, pieces to play with and pack for his long trips. Um, so one of our concerns coming from this report is that we don't actually see a clear uh, plan to fill the gaps that will be left when the city fully hands over blue box collection to producers. Uh, staff have raised really important questions in this report uh, about, for example, who will, who will collect recycling from public spaces. Those are some of the most visible areas of litter in our city. And the regulations only require about half the number of bins that are needed in public spaces. Um, I should also call your attention to the timing of when this might all become very visible, which is 2026. There's something else happening in 2026 where there will be many people in public spaces in Toronto. And we want to make sure they have somewhere to put their numerous 
water bottles uh, and other recyclable items. Uh, and right now, um, we don't see all of those gaps being filled. Um, and <clears throat> you know, this, this also, I want to point out, this should be a cautionary tale about the private sector's tendency to leave gaps. And when the city delivers services, it generally is more about serving the public good and less about fulfilling a contract. Um, and that's why you get pamphlets in 18 different languages and not just one or two, uh, because that makes sense, because people in Toronto speak many, many languages. Um, and we see this borne out in the data on waste collection. Um, you know, the data we have indicates the city side does do it with slightly fewer complaints, slightly higher diversion rates, with the costs running pretty much even. So it's not rocket science to understand why, uh, when the city has more, more oversight and control over services delivered in-house, uh, why this is a really big advantage when you're trying to hit a 70% waste diversion goal. So what do we want coming out of this report? Um, we'd like to see a plan for how to move forwards if producers don't establish a public space recycling program that is adequate. Um, and we also uh, would like to see the city start to take action now to bring whatever waste collection services it can back in-house as quickly as possible. If District 2 is on the table, let's start there. This will make sure that there's more oversight and control over our waste goals uh, so the city can meet really important environmental targets on waste diversion. Uh, so you won't be facing a report potentially in 2030 that says it'll take 10 years uh, to bring these services back in house. So if you start doing the work now, um, it will be much easier than starting to do this work to bring it back in house in 10 years. Thank you very much. I believe I'm over time, but happy to take questions. Thank you. Are there questions of the deputant, Councillor Sachs? Yes, well, congratulations to your son and also to Annette and her team for the quality of your public communication, so well done. Um, as you know, the dramatic and deleterious impacts here are being foisted on us by the province. Mm -hmm. um, your organization also lobbies at the provincial level. Do you see any sign of recognition by uh, Doug Ford and his government of the serious adverse consequences that they are creating? In a word, no. Um, we also, we do see a sign that there is uh, also intense lobbying happening um, to try to further weaken those regulations. Yes. So um, we believe there's a real possibility that things may actually get weaker and may actually get worse than some of the regulations that are currently um, in, in front of us. Do you have any suggestions for preventing that even worse result. I mean, I do think advocacy from the city to the province um, can help make a difference. One of the things T has uh, recommended is um, paying attention to how this rolls out, so tracking and monitoring. If there are impacts that are harming the city uh, and its residents and causing more complaints, for example, that that be tracked uh, and logged so that that evidence can be brought to the province um, and, and other uh, folks uh, who might be able to help change those regulations and make them stronger. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, I should have said, is there anything else you wanted to tell us? No, no. Just I probably should get another copy of this waste guide because my son's going to be super mad that I took it. <laughs> I'll laminate it for you. Uh, <laughs> any additional questions? Okay, thank you for coming. Uh, our next speakers are Dominic McGarry and Ted Avalis. And we have the record updated now with, with the both awesome. of you. Thank you. So, how's it going? Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, Deputy Mayor, and members of the committee. My name is Dominic Malgeri. I'm the treasurer of CUPE Local 416. With me is Ted Avalis, Vice President. We represent 8,000 hardworking City of Toronto employees in Toronto, including those who work within solid waste. At the outset, is it, import it is important to remind everyone that solid waste collection is a fundamental municipal service. Without waste collected, our city would be unclean and unwelcoming for all residents, businesses, and tourists. Curbside collection intersects with many key policy objectives of the city, and I want to state from the outset that Local 416 believes, based on the evidence, that this service is best delivered by public employees. Our members have proved for many years that we provide better value to residents than the private sector on almost every criterion. 
ensuring waste diversion targets are met, collection on the east side is completed with fewer service requests than the private sector on the west side of the city. Public collection is more accountable and mitigates risk as compared to private collection. Put quite simply, the Toronto public delivery of solid waste collection offers more value to residents than contracting it out. I will briefly demonstrate each of our three pillars on why public collection needs to be part of the conversation. Waste diversion is a key policy objective of the city and is consistent with combating climate change. The city aims to get a 90% diversion rate and we are stubbornly stuck at 70%. What we have learned from past evaluations is that public collection comes with improved diversion. There is limited oversight when a private contractor is involved and it is difficult to hold them accountable. To respect our commitment to the environment and as a city, the public option must be reconsidered. Simply put, our members care more about this city and are better at the job. A recent review of service requests or complaints clearly shows that there are fewer complaints on the east side. We examined service request data available from the city and determined that there were more than 18,000 complaints on curbside collection west of Young Street. This is consistent with past findings. There are a number of risks associated with private sector collection. Oversight is more difficult, private solid waste companies are notorious employers, and there is no real competition. This is a highly consolidated industry with only a few players large enough to handle the needs of any of the city's quadrants. Moreover, private waste haulers that have been under contract to the city have a history of poor service and have been cited by the Fair Wage Office there have been questions around their industry business practices. Finally, I want to address the issue of alleged cost savings to the city and the potential investment required for District 2. We know that the savings figures polar, uh, sorry, popularized by previous administration and leadership were not true. If this was a true apples to apples comparison, the cost savings were negligible. If significant spending is required to operationalize District 2 publicly, this should be viewed as other spending is an investment. An investment in the environment, our residents, and dedicated city workers. It would be an investment in this city. We have tried private collection in the West End, and it is, not, and it is not delivered on its promise by any measure. Local 416 will not stop advocating for the residents of the city who live west of Young Street in Districts 1 and 2 to ensure they receive the same level of service as those that live east of Young Street in Districts 3 and 4. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay, are there questions of Deputy Councillor Sachs? Yes, I, I have one question. The, do you have any comments on the rationale expressed in the report for the obstacles to bringing District 2 inside? So the obstacles as we understand them to be, sorry, the obstacles as we understand them to be is always uh, you know, the fleet and where to house them and where to put them. Uh, that's a determination that the city can do. You guys have the ability uh, to look at that, to speed that process up. As we said, make it an investment. So you guys have the ability to look at that data and determine uh, how quick and you know, how long that will take. We don't think it, it would take that long. We think there's probably a more feasible timeline, although we do understand the challenges and restraints that are put on the city. But we think it is very important that the city consider uh, investing back into the residents in District 1 and 2 so they get the same level of service that the other residents get. Additional questions to the deputant? Okay, I'll just say thank you and thanks for everything you do for the city. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thanks for your time on this thank committee. You. Questions of staff? Council, uh, council, outside councillors first, Councillor Nunziata, followed by Councillor Sachs. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, to stop, in the report you mentioned the um, Ingram uh, station, uh, that there's issues with the Ingram station. So can you just elaborate on that, please? Uh, through the chair to the councillor, uh, what we did is we reviewed the current Ingram yard, which was used um, in the early 2000s uh, as a yard for collecting uh, District 2. And the assessment that uh, we made in conjunction with uh, studies with engineering consultants and an internal review is that uh, the site is not uh, suitable 
uh, to house the, the vehicles that we require and the, the staff that uh, would be needed to uh, do the work in District 2. Um, that would be because you also have GFL on, in, next door, right? Um, because there are issues right now, right? Uh, through the chair to the councillor, no, it's not because of GFL. Um, when we look at the Ingram Yard back again in the early 2000s, uh, above there, uh, uh, north, there's a salt dome that I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, and what we did in past practice was park uh, quite a number of our fleet in and around uh, the salt dome area. And over the past uh, number of years, because that work uh, is contracted out, uh, transportation is now fully utilizing the space that solid waste historically did uh, borrow from them, uh, which uh, significantly impacted the space that we had to park vehicles. The other impact as well is, um, again, our fleet uh, being uh, generally fueled through renewable natural gas and, and natural gas needs dedicated fueling stations, whereas the diesel fleet could go fill up uh, at uh, a pump and then park at wherever we could find a spot. So that, again, is another impediment to uh, putting in uh, the collection in, in Ingram Yard at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sachs? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Kelleher, we've heard repeatedly about the differences in uh, public satisfaction between the east and west of Young Street. Other than the fact that one is public and one is private, are there any other material differences that you think explain the different public experience? Uh, through the councillor, uh, no. No, generally the information that we have based on service requests is that uh, both the, the east and the west have a service reliability rate uh, approximately the same at 99.95%, which means that 99.95% uh, of the time, your garbage will be collected uh, without having to put a service request in for a missed collection. So generally, based on the numbers that uh, we have uh, developed uh, through our service requests in 311, the service on that metric is relatively equal. Uh, are there any other uh, significant metrics on which the public service is better? Uh, through the chair to the councillor, uh, the one piece with the public service that, um, you know, in my opinion, uh, makes it better is our ability to have uh, the nimbleness of, of our staff to be able to look and, and do additional work if and when required. Uh, we're not as restricted uh, to use our staff during potential storm events or, or other events like we would be with a contractor who would uh, generally charge us additional labor and equipment time uh, where we could have a little bit more resiliency with, with in-house staff. Uh, that is definitely one of the benefits that, that we have with in-house staff. Uh, what do you anticipate will be the effect on the city of the province cutting the number of recycling receptacles in public spaces in half as the province plans to do? So through the chair to the councillor, that is something that we're currently uh, reviewing right now. Um, we're well aware of some lobby efforts right now to reduce the requirement uh, for producers to have uh, the number of bins that have been identified within the regulations. So just as in context, uh, we have around 15,000 recycling bins across the city and, and the regulation will ultimately cut that in half. So what we have to do is, is review and determine what role the city will have in potentially stop gapping that, uh, that service reduction in the number of bins and return to council with any recommendations. And again, uh, we have yet to hear from the producer groups on their plan moving forward on uh, litter bins in general. All right, but the regulations may be weakened, but already they're going to cut the number of bins in half. And that means poorer service to the public and more costs for the city. Uh, through the, the chair, it uh, on the recycling front, uh, again, the regulations have approximately half of the recycling bins in place. And if there is an additional cost to the city to augment that, that's something that we would bring back to committee and council for direction. Again, we're still waiting to hear if potentially the circular materials or the producer groups want us to uh, do that work in-house or if they are going to contract that out. Again depending on their direction uh, on that approach, we will uh, you know, likely have uh, different recommendations for, for each potential operational model. 
Generally speaking, public space recyclable collection, does it result in cost savings and or significant waste diversion, or is the material so contaminated it goes to landfill anyway? Uh, through the chair to the councillor, uh, generally that material uh, is sent to landfill because it is so contaminated. Okay. Um, we, uh, as um, Sarah Buchanan mentioned, we have FIFA in 2016, or 2026, which is going to be the first year of this new system. Um, what do you think that's going to mean in terms of recycling collection in public spaces and just the general beauty of the city when we're asking the world to look at us? Uh, through the chair, again, uh, you know, we need to fully understand uh, the producer responsibility model on the litter bins, but uh, I know that with our dedicated internal staff who collect those materials in the litter bins, and again, us being nimble with our internal staff will make sure that uh, the city is, is uh, well uh, represented in terms of our cleanliness during that event. So we know it's a problem, but we don't know what to do about it yet. Uh, through the chair to the councillor, we know there is a potential issue and we'll do everything that we can to mitigate it and bring any recommendations to council to address it. So we know there's a problem, but we don't know what to do about it yet. We, through the chair, uh, we anticipate that there may be a problem and we're working on a solution depending on the direction of the producers. And when, pr question. Uh, last question, when private contractors don't adhere to the city's standards, what kind of enforcement do you take and how often does that happen? So through the chair to the councillor, uh, we have liquidated damages in our contracts uh, for our service providers. And what we can do, I can get you those numbers offline. Yes, please. Mr. Mayor Quill cool had questions? Yeah, yes. Uh, I have uh, a photo I want to show. Uh, I was just wondering, I know this is a uh, private collection, right? Through the chair to the councillor, it looks like it, yes. Yeah, so this is uh, happening all over the city. Uh, it's uh, especially where there's strip malls and uh, they're usually behind the uh, stores and it's filled with rats and garbage overflowing. So my staff has to go uh, and report it to, to 311, uh, you know, to, and it's chronic. So, you know, some of these cases I've reported maybe 50 times, over and over and over again. Uh, so we're talking about you know, household garbage, but I find the most serious problem in the city is uh, the lack of remedial action dealing with this uh, strip mall uh, private garbage collection problem uh, in our laneways and uh, behind our main streets. So uh, what do you think we need to do to deal with this? Uh, I think this is a public health issue too, with this problem. So through the chair to the councillor, this is something that uh, when we're informed of, we uh, collaborate with uh, municipal licensing and standards who uh, visits the property and does an assessment and will attempt to, to mitigate the situation. The problem is it's not being handled. Should we look at, did we used to uh, have uh, city, uh, uh, employees pick up this garbage behind these uh, uh, storefronts. I think we did way back when uh, Councillor Nunziata was the mayor of the city of York, we used to have the city of York people pick it up. I used to pick up the garbage. <laughs> I know, you were the best garbage picker we ever had. Okay, anyways, uh, did we have city employees picking up garbage behind these commercial strip malls? Uh, through the chair to the councillor, that's something I'd have to connect with my team on a history of. I'm not quite sure. And so do we ever send in our crews to clean up these areas or is it the responsibility of the uh, 
uh, private property owners to, to do the cleanup. Through the uh, chair to the councillor, uh, I believe one of the, the processes in <clears throat> uh, MLS is to send in uh, a crew, a contracted crew generally, and bill the uh, property owner for remediation of the property. Okay, anyways, uh, I'll, uh, I'm going to speak to that a little later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, just a quick one, um, and to circle back to the um, point from my colleague, Councillor Sachs, around um, the reduction of number of public uh, recycling um, bins available. <laughs> Do we anticipate any impact on our contract with street furniture delivery? I'm thinking about the um, garbage bins that we have uh, in our public spaces. Is there any anticipated impact related to that with this new um, model? Um, through the chair, uh, that is a, a potential. The street litter contract, I believe, expires in, in 2027. Uh, the producers are responsible for the litter uh, effective uh, 2026. So one of the uh, recommendations in this report is to also look at our, um, our litter program uh, in general. And the first step of that is to look at our uh, litter vac contracts. And again, looking uh, into the future, we need to better understand from the producer groups if they are going to be contracting that work out uh, to the city or if they will be contracting that out to a private a service. And uh, based on if we get the work, it would be a different model than if the, the contractors uh, get that work. But that's something that we'll be looking at over the next year and bring, bringing that back to council and committee. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Those are my questions. Thank you. Additional questions? Uh, Councillor Pasternak. Uh, okay, Councillor Pasternak and then Councillor Perutza. Thank you. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. So um, on page 10, um, we get a little bit of a snapshot on what happens after the, after the um, I guess, the, the natural gas, the renewable natural gas leaves the transfer stations. Uh, they go across some kind of pipeline to fuel city vehicles and heat city buildings. But we don't seem to quantify that in any way. We don't seem to say how many vehicles. We don't say what the reach of these pi pipelines are. Uh, we don't say whether this whole project is revenue neutral or, or whether we, it goes into the red and we have to absorb it for the better good. Can you, can you or maybe it's coming in a future report, can you? Sorry, I think you're talking about the next item. You're talking about the organics processing? <laughs> We're not there yet. <laughs> I do apologize. I mixed my pages up. Okay. Uh, Councillor, it happens. It happens to me all the time, too. Uh, Councillor Prusa. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, um, Madam Chair. My question is simply this. Look, I, I understand the report and, and, you know, the limitations that we have and so on. Uh, but I just want to hear, um, in your words, uh, what would it, what would it take for us to bring back the service in house and keep us in this game as a as a city and as a public as a public entity? So through the the chair to the councillor, um, ultimately the decision to bring uh, recycling services into the city uh, is not within our control. Uh, we have been told by the producer groups that they uh, did not want the city to do this work, uh, and we anticipate relatively soon an announcement on the, the contractors who they have uh, given that work to. So uh, we've worked very diligently in the division to um, be as nimble and flexible as we could with the producers during our discussions and, and negotiations, but. Uh, ultimately, uh, the challenge uh, was that we were not able to provide a price for uh, 10 years of collection services uh, for all of the districts. And because we did not have uh, some contracts in place to be able to give them the price, and they ultimately decided to uh, not uh, select the city as a proponent. 
So, so in, in your view, there's nothing that we could do um, that um, would keep us um, in this game, in this process, and, and allow us uh, to continue to, um, to provide the service and to, um, and to expand it uh, 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 back into, into the rest of the city uh, the way we once used to have it. Uh, through the councilor, uh, through the chair to the councilor, um, we do not have any ability to um, to bring in recycling. The, the producers have made their decision, and uh, the city is uh, not in that process anymore. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have. I think everybody's asked questions. I have a few questions. So. On waste collection, can you outline why it would take five years to find a location for waste or be in a position where we could consider uh, bringing this in-house? Uh, through the chair to committee, uh, we've worked very closely with CREM and CREATE TO, to identify uh, industrial locations in and around District 2. And uh, there's approximately a 12 to 18 month uh, timeline to purchase a, a property. And then we would need to have a, a de engineering design uh, that the uh, tendering, the site applications, the procurement, and the development of a site, which generally takes around anywhere between three and four years. Uh, again, we'd need to install our natural gas uh, fueling stations, uh, working with our, our partner on that one. And, and that would generally be in around the, the four to five year range to uh, be in a position to offer this service. So the next contract goes out in 2026. What are the timelines for issuing that RFP? What's its proposed length of contract and um, what will come to council in advance? So we are uh, planning to issue the uh, RFP or RFQ within uh, Q2 uh, subject to council uh, direction. We will be returning back likely in quarter four with the results of that procurement for council approval. Uh, generally, we uh, look to have contracts that are uh, anywhere between five and seven years, which align with the useful life of a, of a vehicle. Okay, and then on EPR, uh, what are the expected impacts of the implementation on the total number of city positions? And uh, can you con commit that all our city employees will be able to remain City of Toronto employees? So through the chair to committee, there's approximately uh, 40 positions that will be impacted. Uh, not 40 staff, uh, just to make that clear. Uh, I did make a commitment to the division last week that there will be no uh, layoffs due to the curbside collection uh, process in, in extender producer responsibility. And uh, we will make sure that during the next two years while we transition, that um, those individuals who, who may be impacted will be uh, realigned to different work within the division. And uh, in terms of collection routing, um, do we know right now, will this have an impact on residents? Like what will the residents see in terms of pickup at their home? Um, are we ready for a seamless transition? Uh, through the chair to committee, the, uh, the, the procurement that went out stipulated that the uh, new service provider must collect the recycling on the same day that the city currently collects it. So uh, that is uh, good news for the, the residents and for us. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're hopeful that once we know who the proponents are, that uh, they will work very closely with us in a seamless transition and a smooth handoff. And I've already made that commitment to uh, Circular Materials that we will go again, as we have through the past uh, number of years above and beyond what I'd say a contractor would do in a handoff. Uh, we will make sure that we have a seamless transition as best, and best as possible. My last question is, do we need to continue our advocacy to ensure that the materials that are collected are as much as the City of Toronto does right now. Um, you know, we don't go to the lowest common denominator across the province, but really to the highest. So does that, should we keep that advocacy going? Through the chair uh, to committee, yes. We, we need to keep pushing that there is no backsliding in the regulations and that residents, not just in Toronto, but across the province, have access to the highest standards of recycling collection and the number of materials that can go in the bin. 
Okay, thank you, and thank you, staff, for the, their work on this. Um, so that completes questions. We'll go to speakers. I also want to flag that for not just this item, but other items, uh, there are a series of motions that are advanced circulated. So if you take a minute to, to have a look through that, that can help with informed conversations going forward. So we'll open it up now for speakers. Speakers on this item? Uh, Councillor Sachs? Yes, thank you very much. Um, so I have a motion, um, which staff have. Yes, uh, two items uh, requested uh, by our solid waste team. As we've heard, these changes are being foisted upon us by the provincial government. Um, now, having been involved in the original development of the Waste Free Ontario Act, the theory was under Minister Glenn Murray that this was supposed to be producer responsibility. This was supposed to remove costs and obligations from municipalities and put them on the producers who profit from creating the waste in the first place um, and to improve recyclability and recycling rates. And of course, under the current government, it's being implemented in a way which is foisting costs on cities and uh, potentially reducing diversion. So this is something the province is doing to us in the teeth of the spirit of the legislation when it was passed and an awful lot of political capital was spilt to get this legislation passed and it's been a constant battle. Waste has been a constant battle for 40 years in Ontario. So one of the things identified by Sarah Buchanan and I guess her son is that the city needs to be speaking up. Cities need to be speaking up about these regulations and doing what we can to counter the uh, very short-sighted, selfish lobbying of the producers who are happy to take the money from creating the waste but are not happy to pay for cleaning it up. Um, and so we need to respond. So our staff need specific authorization in, in order to engage in that advocacy. They've asked for that authority. I'm proposing that they should have it. Um, similarly, we need to have good data. Um, and be able to provide data and analysis, and the staff need that authority. They've asked for it, and I'm proposing they should have it. We need to at least be speaking up for ourselves and for our communities. We can't stop uh, most of the terrible things that Ford does to this city, but we need to at least be loud and proud about what we need. And um, so this, this motion is to do that. Uh, right, and I have another motion also. Yes, sorry. Thank you very much, Matthew. Matthew keeps rescuing me. Um, so there's another motion as well, and it, this, is, this came as a request from the TTC to me. Uh, uh, no, that's not this one. That's the next one. Right, so the, oh, you did two motions for this. So this is the one about uh, negotiating agreements. Sorry, now I got mixed up about the items. Um, so that we do need the general manager to be able to negotiate into agreements uh, as necessary so that we can try to fix uh, what we can, fill up the holes, and thinking again about 2026, it's FIFA, it's elections years, there's going to be a lot of attention to how these changes have affected how our city looks. We know that litter is an enormous problem. It increases research, I've seen it increases crime, it decreases people's feeling of safety and comfort in their city. And anything that increases litter, reduces waste diversion, increases the amount of plastic trash on our streets is bad for the city and bad for the people here. So um, this is what staff have identified we can give them to make it a little easier for them to hold up our end. And so I'm at suggesting that we should give them the authority they've asked for and support them to do as much as we can. And thank you again, Matthew. Okay, thank you. Additional speakers? Uh, Deputy Mayor Cole. So, uh, I don't have a motion because as you know, I'm trying to cut down on motion pollution because uh, our, uh, and not to downgrade to the emotions, the uh, intention of the councillors, that's fine, but I just think our staff have so much to do and they don't need to handle hundreds of more motions every week. So, uh, but I just want to bring it to uh, everyone's attention that I think one of the hidden uh, uh, waste issues uh, that uh, doesn't receive any attention 
is this um, waste issues uh, that uh, are uh, really um, polluting and destroying our main streets, and that is uh, with these uh, private contractors and private arrangements that uh, commercial property owners have with private collectors. Uh, this is uh, really out of control, uh, and this is something that I see all over the city of Toronto, where these uh, commercial uh, garbage bins are overflowing on a regular basis. Uh, not only is it unsightly, it smells, and it's uh, also contributing to uh, the rodent infestation on our main streets. And I think uh, we've got to start to look at this and see how this can be controlled because MLS is essentially um, overwhelmed with all their complaints they get uh, about everything across the board. They don't have the staff. The follow through is very complicated. By the time the owners uh, get uh, served with a notice and uh, the notice is enforced and there's cleanup, the garbage bins are overflowing again. So it's just going on continually, continually. It doesn't stop. And I know some of you don't go to the back alleys, uh, but I do. Uh, I jog and I go through our laneways. I go in behind the stores on Eglinton, on Dufferin, on Myrtle, and I see the, and smell the disaster. And I get the complaints from the residents saying, we have a house behind the strip mall, and the garbage is constantly overflowing. It doesn't get rectified. And uh, it has got to go beyond MLS. So I, I just will continue to find a way of getting this uh, to be brought forward to people's attention that something can be done to deal with this uh, secret uh, garbage disaster which is occurring all over the city of Toronto. So uh, again, um, uh, I'll work with staff offline to try and find maybe approaches to dealing with this uh, very, very disturbing problem, which uh, is a uh, growing one in our city. Thank you very much. Thank you. I forgot to set the timer, but I'm pretty sure that was under five minutes, so thank you. Uh, additional speakers, last call. Uh, Councillor Prutza. Yeah, just uh, just really a couple of comments and, and just started to, to express, um, I guess, sort of once again, my disappointment on how we got to where we got. You know, it's it's interesting as someone who has um, um, been around this for, for some time, how this sort of on and off again, ideological debate about um, uh, private versus public and, 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 you know, who does it better and who does it cheaper and how do we get to a better place? And, and it, it's actually exposed, a, you know, a whole bunch of weaknesses in the, in, in the public system, or where I believe um, we've always been competitive, not only in terms of the service that we provide around waste collection, something that we have done for, I guess, through, through this city and, and the previous cities, uh, certainly in my time, for, uh, for many, many decades. Uh, it's a business, it's a service uh, that we grew, uh, that we learned to do, uh, that we did well, or, or rather that we do well. In fact, uh, you know, over the past couple of cycles in, in the past council, when we compared the service, East versus West, you know, East of Young Street, West of Young Street, similar neighborhoods, bananas to bananas uh, comparisons, apples to apples, uh, you know, no one could make the case that uh, the private sector, A, could do it cheaper or better. In fact, the reverse is true. Even though there was an ideological push to say we should be privatizing all of it. We should be, you know, east of Young Street, uh, east of Pickering, I don't know, uh, west of Mississauga, just give it all up. You know, get out of their way, right? Because they're going to do it better. Well, you know what? Even, even with that big push, uh, what, the, what the data has demonstrated is that we're just as competitive, maybe even more so, 
but what we actually provide uh, in, in the grand scheme of this whole thing is, is you, you have this public sector uh, a company, call it, that keeps everybody else to some degree honest. And I suspect that they hated that. They hated that and they wanted us out of the way. Uh, I think somebody earlier made the point that uh, there are very few outfits uh, you know, across the province that are actually big enough uh, to collect uh, uh, all the waste, uh, whether it's recycling, whether it's garbage and, and uh, organics and, and, and so on. We've seen also uh, some of the other result on the other side in terms of the city and how the city has gotten dirtier. All right? So, so as you read this, and the reason I asked the question earlier about uh, what would it take uh, to, to bring it back, the answer is really clear. We've been told we're out of it. We've been told that that's it, that we're done. This is over for us. You know, somehow we let ourselves be maneuvered into a place when there's finally a business case to be made that says that we should be fighting like hell to stay in this, what will otherwise be a very, very lucrative business for folks going forward, the city of Toronto included. That's when we say, throw up our hands and say, we've, we've been maneuvered out of this. Either we, they maneuvered us, either we let them maneuver us, either we weren't up to the task, either we weren't risk takers like the private sector is, willing to gamble, you know, uh, um, way more, whether we were too far, too short-footed, whether just simply the public sector when it comes to this stuff is just simply woefully ill-equipped to demonstrate competitiveness at, at, at the onset. Maybe this is where you needed to take a risk and say, you know what? We need to do everything we can to try to stay in this game because ultimately it's going to be very, very lucrative. Lots of money to be made here. But hey, we don't want to make money for the citizens of the city of Toronto, right? We're good. We're just good to go. Thank oh. you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think that's that was it for speakers. Uh, so I have a motion. So uh, the first part is. Um, asking city staff to look at the way we manage litter in the city of Toronto. So similar to they just did with waste to come back to see if there are any opportunities for a managed competition bringing or bringing this in house. Um, for one, the vacuum operations, and then the second for the street bins uh, when that goes out. The second is, um, and you, you heard this commitment from the manager of solid waste, um, but it's just reiterating our commitment to it as well, that city council formally expressed its commitment to ensuring that any staff currently employed by the city and that may have their positions impacted by the blue box transition to extended producer responsibility will be supported throughout the transition so that they can continue to work for the city of Toronto. And the third is we have this report come back regularly to us uh, that the general manager solid waste report back to the infrastructure committee on the comparison to the service standards and metrics between districts for daytime curbside waste collection. And the reason for that being if we are going out for procurement, um, it holds them to account for how their service is uh, comparing to the other parts of the city. Um, I want to start by thanking our, our city staff, as, as I always do, uh, for their continued work on this issue and their commitment to ensuring a seamless transition for the citizens of Toronto from uh, the current way we manage recycling to the new extended producer responsibility that the province has brought in. And uh, we should know, everybody should know that the City of Toronto has really been a leader in this program and we were one of the first to go through the transition and that was to help ensure that we have a seat at the table to ensure that seamless transition and to continue to advocate so that 
the most materials can be recycled through this program and so that we can maintain the high service standards that we have in the City of Toronto. And uh, we know that we need to ensure a seamless transition and that our customers don't experience a break in a break or disruption to collections. And uh, so I thank staff for the commitment to that. Um, I also want to thank 416 for, for coming today, for their advocacy, um, not just for their staff, but also for the residents of the City of Toronto. And I know that's something that they take seriously as a commitment in their roles. And so I thank them for that. And I completely understand their disappointment with what's before us today their disappointment that there will be an upload of recycling to the province and their disappointment that the path for bringing um, back some of the waste collection to the city of Toronto is, um, is, is full of, of difficulties and a long timeline to be able to do that. And uh, so I understand their disappointment. But I think we also have to be realistic because the worst thing we could do is promise that this is something that we could achieve when we know um, the pathway there is hard and that we can't accomplish it within two years when this goes out for contract. So I think it's important we continue to always look at our city services, look at how they can be delivered better. Um, my motions today ask to look at that comparison be between the contracted out and collection in-house for waste and to look at how we can do litter in a better way going forward. And so I look forward to continued partnership with our um, amazing city staff uh, in that regard. So with that, I will call the question on the different votes. Okay, so the first motion by Councillor Sachs. This is the one about EPR. All those in favor, all those opposed, that carries. Second motion by Councillor Sachs, and this one is uh, looking at services um, for different agencies. All those in favor, all those opposed, that carries. The third is, is my motions around litter, report back on metrics, and, uh, and uh, protection of city staff. All those in favor, all those opposed, that carries. And the item is amended. All those in favor, all those opposed, that item carries. Okay, thank you. Our next item is IE 12.2, Organics Processing Facilities Update. We have one speaker, Jason Moretto. Thank you for joining us. When you're ready, you have five minutes. Thank you, you have five minutes. Sorry? Pardon me? Thank you for hosting me today. My name is Jason Moretto. I am the uh, CEO and president of Enves Corp. We are a independent energy producer and we provide mid-market infrastructure solutions and sustainability solutions. Our infrastructure solutions are provided through a design, build, own, operate and finance model. And we provide our sustainability solutions through our subsidiary Bullfrog Power that provides 
um, environmental attributes to thousands of commercial and residential customers. Several of you may know that we are, have been a good partner to the City of Toronto for several years. We currently process the City of Toronto's green bin source separated organics through a contract that we procured in 2021. We are also a leader in the uh, processing, recycling of green bin waste. We recent wins uh, with the Durham region uh, a few months ago, 10-year contract, Essex Windsor Solid Waste Authority, and as you can see, we've processed for region of Peel, York Region, Halton, and Simcoe as well. Um, we've been a good partner to the City of Toronto. As a matter of fact, in September, when um, there was an issue at the Dufferin Disco Road facilities, in a, in a pinch, we were asked to uh, take on additional volumes immediately and we were there to help the city out in processing additional volumes over and above our uh, contracted um, uh, capacities. Our original facility, which is Seacliff Energy in Leamington, Ontario, is permitted for 110,000 tonnes per year. Um, and so we have, we, we're, um, we built this facility in 2010 we have been processing uh, source separated organics and commercial organics for over a decade. We are leaders in this space. We are, uh, this was the first privately owned commercial scale anaerobic digester in Canada. And we're one of the few groups, if, if uh, the only group that has over 10 years of experience processing this material in the private sector. Um, and again, permitted for 110,000 tons of capacity, so you can parallel that with the two city facilities at Dufferin and Disco Road that have a combined capacity of 130,000 metric tons per year. Recently, several municipalities have abandoned the idea of building and operating digesters, taking a pause to do the hard math and reflecting on a changing economy. The price tag to taxpayers is too high. A recent example of this is this uh, report to the uh, Simcoe uh, Committee of the whole on February 27th, 2024. I'll read the quote. A recent competitive procurement released by the county has resulted in costing to be much lower than is currently paid for these services, so much so that the average cost of the Environmental Resource Recovery Center, $379 million, would be approximately $221 million more than the business as usual case that reflects the new contract pricing. And you can see in this report the conclusion of a life cycle analysis by Ernst & Young shows that the uh, low and high um, estimated costs of building uh, their own facility at Horseshoe Valley uh, averages about 379 million, topping out at over 500 million dollars. The recent procurement that concluded in February comes in at 157 million dollars and a, a savings of 221 million dollars, but up to 350 million dollars for life cycle of that project. I'll read another quote from the same report. This financial model clearly illustrates that at this moment in time, it is best to not proceed with the Environmental Resource Recovery Centre. This is due to the significant capital and operating costs, the uncertainty stemming from global inflation and supply chain risks. This case is further proven through the updated pricing received from the recent organics processing RFP. There's also a building consensus across municipalities of, of Southern Ontario, as you can see here. The region of Peel in 2022 made a decision, and I'll quote, the region of Peel spent $17.5 million planning to build an anaerobic digester before it was canceled. Council voted in closed session to stop the project citing cost overruns 
staff sent back to the drawing board. It was not what we expected, said Councillor Ron Starr, Chair of the Waste Management Strategic Advisory Committee, explaining that the bids were far over budget. It was no longer in the public interest to proceed. Currently, Peel's green bin material is composted at the region's in-house site and then sent out to privately owned facilities for processing. Also, Durham Region in 2022 wrote, Durham Regional Council has made the decision to cancel, cancel the mixed waste pre-sort and anaerobic digestion facility procurement process. The project was approved and is a key component of the region's long-term waste management plan. Unfortunately, due to the rapid rise in material shipping and labor costs being experienced in the marketplace, Regional Council has agreed with the recommendation from staff to revisit the short and long-term organic strategy and report back to Regional Council in early 2023. Thank you. Sorry, I know you can't see the clock, so I'll just ask for a, a final thought. You're, sure. you're well over six minutes. Okay, uh, thanks for your patience. Um, final thought is that the uh, scope of the work on the third digester of Toronto has changed so dramatically that it needs to be RFP'd, put in a, uh, in a uh, procurement process because there are alternatives in the private industry. We're building another site at Dundalk, Ontario that's permitted for 73,000 tonnes and is within 100 kilometres of the DISCO facility. Another reason Please wrap up. why a, a procurement should be run is because of the indications in the City of Toronto's Reconciliation Action Plan, which there is a standalone Indigenous procurement strategy, and I believe Councillor Sachs and Pasternak were big proponents of this. We need to have Indigenous participation in procurements from the city, and uh, we highly endorse this. We want the city to take a, a leadership Thank position you. in incorporating mm -hmm. Indigenous scoring in future procurements. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you for coming. Questions of city staff? Seeing none, speakers to this item? Oh yes, Councillor Pasternak has a question. That's right, all right. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, for- uh... There was no questions of the deputants. They're for okay. city staff, thank you. Thank you. So through you to staff, um, and I, I did sort of semi-ask this question earlier on the other item, on page 10, uh, we talk about how renewable natural gas, RNG, goes from organics, and it talks about injecting it into a natural gas pipeline to help fuel, fuel city fuel vehicles and heat city buildings. But it's not quantified in, in any way, the, the commercial value of this gas, the the uh, the pipeline network, um, the the fleet management, and and where they uh, where they sort of uh, fill up. Um, is there any more details that you could provide, maybe at future reports or right now, on on the reach of this system and whether it's revenue neutral or whether there's savings, whether it's uh, in the red uh, through the chair to uh, to committee uh, so the renewable natural gas that's generated at uh, Dufferin right now and will be generated at Disco in the coming months uh, goes into the Enbridge uh, pipeline system so that system is spread all through the uh, the province uh, the the gas the, the renewable natural gas is is currently used by the city in fleet and in our buildings what it is right now is we blend the, uh, the, the cubic meters that's produced uh, with existing natural gas to make a blended renewable natural slash nat natural gas product. Uh, when these two facilities are fully operational, they'll generate around 7 million cubic meters of, natural, of renewable natural gas, which represents close to 15% of what the city consumes. So when these two facilities are operational, 15% of all natural gas that's consumed by the city will be renewable. Uh, we're also looking at expanding this out at our landfill as well uh, at, uh, at Green Lane, again, increasing the amount of, of renewable natural gas that the city could use 
and or sell in the future, depending on the appropriate business model. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So uh, when we bring Enbridge in, we think uh, transportation costs, and I know when we get our bill at our home, uh, they continually argue that they make no money off the gas, and all they collect is a transportation fee. Uh, do we pay that same fee? Uh, through the uh, chair to uh, the councillor, yes, we pay uh, fees to Enbridge to, to move the, the gas and, and to store it. Uh, but because we have uh, been in partnership uh, with them for this project and the, or both Dufferin and, and Disco, uh, we have uh, received some uh, very uh, favorable uh, rates. Uh, again, the rates are dictated by the OEB. Uh, and um, I, the short answer to the question is yes, we do pay them to move the gas. So in the top end of recommendation, staff recommendations, a number of these things are procurement, um, including number four, which involves this company, GHD. Uh, but on the last page, you're, you're, asking, you're asking for really permissions for a sole source, uh, not to really go out to an RFP, but to, to really just renegotiate an extension of the work we're doing with, with GHD, whoever they are. Um, is this, is this a good decision for the city? I mean, go, usually going out to a marketplace with competitive bids is sort of standard policy. So through the, through the chair to the councillor, uh, GHD is, is currently uh, an owner's engineer at the sites. And with regard to DISCO uh, road expansion, uh, we already have a contract with them that was procured. Uh, for 50 percent of design and the ask is to get council's authority to extend that to 100 percent design it's much more cost effective to use the existing contractor to do the last 50 percent of design rather than getting a new contractor in uh, learning about the the facility getting up to date and then redesigning something that's already been designed 50 percent okay thank you okay thank you additional questions city staff council stocks Yes, uh, thank you. So, Mr. Kelleher, I see the recommendation to do a sole source purchase. Um, I always worry about whether we're going to get a fair price on a sole source purchase. Uh, why are you recommending it and why shouldn't I worry? Uh, through the, the chair to the councillor, so the construction work at the site will be procured through a, a public process. Uh, the uh, engineering work that, again, as mentioned uh, previously, is around 50% done. Using the sole source authority to get that 100% uh, is best value for money. In terms of the additional sole source authorities on some of the technical equipment, uh, we already have um, pulpers right now at Disco Road, and we're looking to expand the site with the existing type of technology rather than have multiple uh, technologies at that site, which will create multiple spare part inventories, multiple different uh, training uh, and, and management uh, coordination of, of two different systems. So we're building out the system that we have now with the same technology that we have uh, to ensure that the system is run effectively, mitigates risk, and we can get the work done uh, a little bit quicker uh, and uh, overall uh, reduce the, the costs of our expansion program. Thank you. Additional questions? Okay, speakers to this item. The speakers? And there were no motions, right? Okay. I'll, I'll move the staff. All right. All those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. That brings us to 12.3 Toronto's climate change readiness update on commitments and a refresh mandate for coordinating resilience activities. We have nine speakers. I'll call you out in groups just so you can get ready and you know when you're up next. So our first speaker is Hao Sen Chong with the Toronto Environment Alliance, followed by Anushin Selvasegar, followed by Zual Kayami. So our first speaker up is Hao Sen. Oh, you're online. There you go. Okay, five minutes. Thank you. Thanks. I developed a cough, so I figured I didn't want to infect people. We thank you um, for that. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, I'm Hao Sen. I'm the climate campaigner at the Toronto Environment Alliance. I want to start uh, by applaud. Can you hear me? Is everything all right? Great. Oh, hi. Okay. I want to start by uh, applauding the significant, significant progress in climate accountability and reporting uh, that we're seeing here today. This is a really important uh, 
this is really important because honesty and transparency are themselves climate solutions even when that transparency reveals unpleasant realities and the unpleasant reality is that toronto is not on track to achieve our emission targets here's a quote Accepting the pandemic-induced dip in 2020-2021, Toronto's emissions have been tracking above all scenarios, end quote. This means that our emissions are now worse off than what we'd originally thought we'd be, where we originally thought we'd be at had we actually done nothing. And so, therefore, in order to reach our Transform TO goals, we actually have to use the Transform part of the Transform TO. We actually need to take transformative action. City staff makes it very clear in this report, quote, to eliminate emissions, the use of fossil fuels to heat our buildings and power our transportation must stop, end quote. There is no fossil fuel that will act as a bridge to our transition. We cannot continue building fossil fuel in infrastructure with 40-year payback periods when we need to be at net zero within 15. So we have to decarbonize and we're encouraged by the clarity and the frankness of this message. So we have some suggestions for areas to accelerate uh, this work. First, the report says that the city will uh, overshoot its internal corporate reduction targets if current emissions trends continue. So the city needs to show leadership by setting clear timelines and actions to completely phase out fossil gas from its own facilities. And we need to see this phase out included in the next short-term plan for 2026 and 2030 to make sure the city doesn't keep putting public dollars into stranded assets. For the proposed resilience plan, staff have proposed doing a thorough vulnerability assessment and we support this, but residents need access to this information. So we strongly recommend the need for this vulnerability assessment to be made public so residents have access. And because residents made vulnerable in emergencies are most likely to be supported by their neighbors and community organizations, we strongly recommend that the city include an explicit focus on examining social infrastructure and community partnerships while doing this resilience plan. Number three, in order to scale up transformative emissions reductions, the staff report makes it clear that the largest and most challenging portion of the city's emissions inventory are emissions from existing buildings. So we do strongly support the city staff call to fully implement emissions performance standards to get buildings on a predictable pathway to cut emissions, but we cannot rely solely on the EPS to cut such a large proportion of the city's emissions. We need other tools, which include transformative quantum leap improvements and increases in funding for retrofits and decarbonization of existing buildings. Yes, we need federal funding. Yes, money from emissions performance standards uh, should be included in that, but we also need to explore the financing of building retrofit grant and loan programs through the issuing of green bonds to long-term investors like pension funds. We also need to completely rethink our relationship with surface transportation. Cities around the world have found significant climate, health, and welfare benefits by dedicating more of their surface street streets to transit priority corridors, bikeways, and vibrant pedestrian avenues. So it's T strong and supports cycle TO's call to dramatically increase the city's cycling network plan. Uh, the 2025-2027 cycling network plan needs to meet needs to target at least 150 kilometers to be on pace to be com to complete the 500 kilometers citywide major routes by 2030. And we also support uh, the integration of Indigenous worldviews. Uh, we are very encouraged and appreciate the importance of connecting uh, the commitments the city's already made with the Reconciliation Action Plan and adopting the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, we have some more details on these points in our letter to this committee, which is post on Timis. I would like to end on one final point where T is in complete agreement on this report. On page nine of the report, the, the report says, quote, a net zero future has never been more unattainable, more attainable, and unquote. I've been an activist, a climate activist for nearly 25 years, and I too have never felt so optimistic about the technical and the social progress that we've made um, to halt climate change than I do right now. But in order for us to get there, Toronto needs, in order to go up, to get there, Toronto needs leadership from this committee and from this council to make these decisions. And these decisions are hard and they're transformative and they're very, very positive. So I'll end there and I'll take any questions if anybody has any. Thank you. I mean, it's hard. I didn't want to wrap you up on optimism, but 
Five minutes is five minutes. <laughs> uh, questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you for joining you. us. Our next speaker is Anishin Selva Segar, followed by Zuel Kaomi, followed by Lynn Adamson. Do we have Anushin in the room? Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Uh, hello, is, is it on? Uh, yeah, okay. Hello, members of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. My name is Anushin Selvasegar, and I'm a member of the St. Jamestown Climate Action Crew. I'm deputing today on Toronto's climate change readiness recommendations. As a member of the St. Jamestown community, I have seen how the impacts of climate change have affected us. We are a community full of low income households, which includes elderly residents and people with disabilities. I mention this as these members of our community are the most vulnerable when it comes to a heat wave. We've heard firsthand during some of our outreaches of how some cannot take the heat in their own homes. New ACs provided by the building in exchange for an old window AC, breaking and unable to pay to repair it. Elderly residents usually have no one at home to take care of them. Rooms in some of the building's lobbies being locked away and unused by residents, one being used as storage space in one case. The proposed recommendations for supporting climate resilience as a city, an approach that will prioritize indigenous worldviews as well as more access to information, expertise to guide, and expertise to guide the city are important because they all revolve around working together with communities towards a common goal. As a member of the St. Jamestown Climate Action Crew, we've been able to hold outreaches and meetings to educate one another about how we can handle heat waves and general emergency preparedness. It's thanks to these outreaches that we've all been able to learn about how we can keep ourselves and our neighbors safe. In addition, City Council should also consider the use of our green spaces. We have some green spaces that mostly just consist of grass, a couple of flowers, and a ravine on the border of St. Jamestown that hasn't been maintained. Instead of just grass, we could do something productive with it. We could add some benches or like a little vegetable or herb garden as well as provide resources to local support groups like, our, like ours so we can continue and improve our work in St. Jamestown and hopefully other neighborhoods as well. When you're considering the recommendations, I hope you will remember that the St. Jamestown community has vulnerable residents who will benefit from having support during heat waves. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any possible questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Councillor Sachs. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, are you aware that there are grants for community groups uh, to support climate action through the Environment Climate Division? Oh, no, I'm not aware, no. All right, so James Nolan over there, wave, please. You can speak with him afterwards as to how to apply. Okay, 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 All thank right. you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Our next speaker is Zual Kaomi, followed by Lynn Adamson, followed by Priyan De Silva. Do you have Zual? Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Hello, members of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. My name is Zohal Kiyumi, and I am a member of the St. Jamestown Climate Action Group. I am deputing today on Toronto's climate change readiness recommendations. As a member of the St. Jamestown community, I have seen firsthand how the impacts of climate change affect residents and high-rise buildings across St. Jamestown putting their health and well-being at risk. With heat events such as heat waves becoming more frequent and intense due to climate change, it has become increasingly evident in our community that residents, particularly those living in high-rise buildings, face significant challenges in coping with extreme temperatures. These challenges include inadequate access to cooling systems, limited green spaces, and exacerbation of health conditions. When discussing with neighbors on how to keep cool during heat waves, they would often resort to closing curtains and their lights to keep as cool as possible, as many did not have air conditioners. As temperatures continue to rise, addressing these issues become crucial to ensure the safety and resilience of our community members. The City Council's confirmation of support for a renewed focus and coordinated approach on the climate resilience in the City of Toronto is critical for Toronto, especially for communities like St. Jamestown, which are vulnerable to climate change impacts. 
By confirming the support, the City Council acknowledges the urgency of addressing environmental challenges. In St. Jamestown, where residents are often faced with heat waves and other climate-related risks due to high-rise living condition, such support is essential. It signifies a commitment to implementing measures that enhance community resilience, such as improved infrastructure, emergency preparedness initiatives, and green spaces. This coordinated approach ensures that resources are allo allocated effectively to mitigate climate risk and protect vulnerable communities like St. Jamestown from the adverse effects of climate change. When you're considering the recommendations, I hope you'll remember the importance of community engagement and collaboration. Communities like St. Jamestown are on the front lines of climate change impacts and their voices and experiences must inform decision-making processes. By involving residents, local organizations, and external partners in the development and implementation of climate resilience strategies, we can create solutions that are tailored to the needs and realities of those most affected. Additionally, prioritizing equity and inclusion ensures that marginalized communities receive the support and resources they require to adapt and thrive in the face of environmental challenges. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions for the deputant? Thank, thank you for coming in. It's, it's very nice to see new faces here deputing today. So thanks for coming in and your colleague at the St. Jamestown Climate Action Crew as well. Our next speakers are Lynn Adamson, Priyan De Silva, followed by Allison Stewart. Uh, we have Lynn in the room or online? Hi, Lynn, you have five minutes. Hi, Lynn. Um, we just need you to unmute. Lynn, I'm going to come back to you so that uh, maybe they can. Okay. Oh, I'm, we got you. Okay, great. I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm unmuted now. Thank you. Okay, thank um, you. We can yes, hear you. You have five minutes. Thank you for for the opportunity to speak today, and I want to thank the staff for their dedicated work. Um, their real commitment is, is very obvious in working with them. I'm a member of the Climate Advisory Group, and I see um, how hard they work. Um, however, this report makes it clear that we're not on track to achieve our emissions targets. Um, we're tracking uh, above all scenarios. So we have to have big changes to effectively address the climate crisis and reach our targets. We have to accelerate our climate action. So there's a number of, of things in my letter, and other people have, have mentioned them as well in, in other letters and spoken, um, to accelerate action in buildings. For example, we need new uh, sources of funding so that we can accelerate the um, retrofits um, and, uh, and transition to electrification. Uh, resilience, it's been mentioned already, that's really important, and we need a resilience and adaptation action plan including the Indigenous worldview, is very important. And when the public understands the threats to public safety, health, infrastructure, and their livelihoods, they will uh, be more supportive of the investments that we need to make in um, our climate plan. I want to support the need for rebuilding the cycling network, which I know is our next item on the agenda as well. Uh, this program, along with improvements to transit and walking, to encourage the shift away from cars. Communication and engagement is the main point I wanted to make today. I think it's so important. I attend webinars with a group called ReClimate, and they um, I just went to one yesterday with them. They do research and polling on, on the public attitudes to climate change and climate change action, and we are losing. We are losing on this uh, because the oil and gas industry has a, has a very... Um, uh, you know, slick and very omnipresent advertising campaign to convince people that we can't reach these quick targets. We can't um, electrify as quickly as we know that we actually can. Their message is delay. And so to counter this, we need a combination of, impro of approaches to engage the public. I do recommend that the city's communication investments have got to be effective. So uh, an organization like ReClimate, they understand the messaging that is needed, and we also need investment in actual advertising to, to reach people, as well as the, the excellent uh, programs that we have for 
grants really really good but that we public advertising has to be there and as phrases for example later is too late apparently resonate well they they talk about these phrases and we need to think ahead and use those um we also need to we need to develop this understanding so that people will vote for representatives at all three <laughs> levels politically uh, who are committed to taking the needed climate action. <clears throat> my apologies for my throat there, sorry. Uh, for a safe future, we've got to, we've got to do this. Um, the Climate Advisory Group <clears throat> has a number of working groups set up which are gonna be helpful in working with staff to engage the public. We need to work with CDSB uh, and other school boards. Um, we need community hubs for education and action. We need a lot of steps to be taken in order to accelerate. Um, and we encourage an earlier report date in 2025 than what's recommended. But otherwise we're, we're um, quite positive about the steps the city is taking. We just have to really close the gap and that's going to take uh, a lot of work together. Uh, we have a great plan, but we got to implement it. So I'm going to leave it at that for today. I've also written in a letter. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you for joining us. Our next speaker is Priyan De Silva, followed by Alison Stewart, followed by Ann Kearney. Uh, sorry, Kiri. Uh, Priyan, do we have you online? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, me? Priyan. You have three. Uh, sorry, five minutes. Thanks for joining us. Uh, good morning, Anin uh, Chimigwaj. Hello. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Councillors, city staff, um, including the IT department, thank you for making this possible while reducing greenhouse gases. I would also like to acknowledge the post-secondary students who are observing this process. Uh, usually during a deputation, uh, my main role would be to provide data and insights into resiliency within communities, specifically North Scarborough. Today, however, I would like to share a few insights on how residents, including myself, are looking at this multi-decade process with their own eyes. The barriers, the solutions, um, and anything else that, that we are engaged in by tackling this climate change. So why am I here today? It's been quite a while since I've engaged with the city of Toronto through a deputation process, but it is vitally important for individuals all across the city to ensure that they communicate their needs, the barriers that they face, and their ideas in combating climate change. It is also important to ensure that community, co committees and council and city staff are aware of our organizing with, that is occurring within our communities and neighborhoods. It's not just uh, data that is sent to city staff, but it's also the people behind it. So what is it that I actually want to say about what's been happening the last decade? So I've had several conversations leading up to this deputation, um, including having a conversation with an activist in Etobicoke, having a conversation with a 55 and above group in North York. And these have been great platforms for ideas to be exchanged. And we've exchanged them equitably. We've talked about access to locally grown food, transportation that reduces greenhouse gas emissions, and just feel good stories of neighborhood wins that we've had in the past few years. As opposed to a decade ago, it is the amount of collaboration that has increased, and it has increased to a point of critical mass. This bodes well for our future as a city. We understand the hurdles that we face, and organizing and mobilizing at a resident-led level has created uh, opportunities, phenomenal opportunities. The changes that are being requested and fought for are not occurring through acquiescence, but rather through the strategic means of getting to know your neighbor, getting to know your community, ident identifying our own biases and our strengths and resolving inequity. In North Scarborough, we still have discussions surrounding transportation, but the narrative has shifted. It is no longer about subways versus buses. It is no longer about the ownership of cars. It has changed to how do we change our lifestyles to that so that access and mobility 
doesn't cost us greenhouse gas emissions. We no longer discuss housing just as a place where we live and grow, although it still is. We started to converse about how do we ensure people living in homes have access to the things they need, food, locally grown food, utilizing space within our own homes to create healthier options through reduction and reuse. An example of this is creating a food system that utilizes a farm in the hydro corridor and a farmer's market and a social organization in North Scarborough. There has been an increase in knowledge exchange surrounding climate change adaptation and mitigation, and a new term has arisen in this transition, climate justice. So what's the ask here? I seem to be running out of time. So what's the ask here? Just to work out what our neighborhoods and communities are involved in, there has been a rise in the need for social identity data. So thanks to multiple social organizations and institutions within the city, the collection, retention, and insights of social identity data have been helping change the narrative for this climate fight to ensure climate justice. So the ask is that the city continues to push to get as much data in this transition as possible so we are equitably able to make the changes we need within our neighborhoods and community. Um, as another deputy had mentioned, um, in all our conversations, we are cautiously optimistic about this city in this space. Thank Final you. Final thought. Oh, perfect. Right on five minutes. Great. Uh, questions of the deputant. Okay. Thank you for joining us, Priyan. Our next speaker is Alison Stewart, followed by Anne Kiri, followed by Chris Chopic. Actually, Michael will be the next. Okay. Great. Uh, Michael, you have five minutes. Hi, Michael. Oh, great. There you are. You have five minutes. Thank you. There we go. Jeez, Louise. It's only been four years, and I still don't know how to unmute myself. Um, thank you, Chairperson McKelvey and uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Michael Longfield, and I'm the Executive Director of Cycle Toronto. Uh, you heard earlier from House and from T about Cycle Toronto's ask for 150 kilometers of new bikeways. Um, I promise you it won't be the last time. The annual Transform TO net progress and accountability report is blunt. Despite some progress since the city's uh, adoption of Transform TO, Toronto is nowhere near on pace to meet its greenhouse gas emission targets and achieve net zero by 2040. It's even more dire by sector. Transform TO's active transportation goals are even more ambitious, with 75% of trips under 5K walked, transited, or biked by 2030, less than seven years away. In order to reach this ambitious target, we're going to need a lot more people riding bikes. But for many of the Torontonians, the under 5K trips envisioned by Transform TO are not a viable option. Even with the recent expansion of the cycling network, there are still too many parts of the city where even a short trip can feel unsafe or impossible. So key to meeting this target will be ensuring there is a safe and connected network of bikeways citywide, including North York, Scarborough, and Etobicoke. This was the stated goal of the 2001 official Toronto Bike Plan, championed by then Councillor Olivia Chow. Over 20 years later, however, we're still not there, as the Progress and Accountability Report in, a, in Attachment 1 states on page 7, and I quote, There is more access to safe walking and biking infrastructure than before the pandemic, but Toronto Cycling Network Plan remains on a, quote, business as planned pace instead of the ambitious build-out seen in the net 040 scenario. Businesses planned is not good enough. In order to put Toronto back on track, Cycle Toronto reiterates our call to complete the 100 kilometers of bikeways in the council approved 2022-2024 cycling network plan under then Mayor John Tory, which includes key projects like Avenue Road, Trithui Drive, Eglinton Avenue, and Danforth Kingston and Scarborough. Together, these four projects alone account for nearly 25% of that 100 kilometers. And while we're encouraged that Eglinton uh, TA Complete Streets report is scheduled to come to this committee in May, which frankly is nearly a decade since the project was approved by City Council, folks in Scarborough are still waiting for a public consultation on Danforth Kingston that was originally planned for fall 2023 and as of spring 2024 still has no date. 
This committee's leadership is essential to achieving the goal of the original of the of this cycling network plan and ensuring the success of these projects. As members of this committee know, staff are currently working on proposals for the next 2025-2027 cycling network plan that will hopefully come to committee later this year. In order to get the city back on track with those Transform TO climate action goals and our Vision Zero road safety targets, Cycle Toronto is calling on members of this council, members of this committee, members of council, and Mayor Olivia Chow for an ambitious 150 kilometer target that would average over 50 kilometers of years of new bikeways over those three years. I do want to remind members of this committee that betting on cycling is a political winner. In the recent mayoral by-election, regardless of who folks voted for, over 85% of voters rejected the divisive rhetoric of candidates trying to use bikeways as a wedge issue. Other major cities like Montreal under Valerie Plante and Paris under Mayor Hidalgo are making headlines and transforming their communities and winning re-elections by creating friendlier public realms that embrace active transportation. They've essentially continued their pandemic pace of ex expanding their cycling network, which Toronto started under Active TO. Toronto cannot be left behind. We've got a dedicated staff team and strong political leadership, and we have the potential to match other major cities that are accelerating their cycling networks. If they can do it, why not Toronto? Like you, we want a more vibrant public realm. We want to ease traffic congestion and give people more transportation options. We want to achieve net zero for a greener, healthier future. We want to connect communities from downtown to the suburbs. We want to eliminate road violence and make Vision Zero a reality. Bikes can do that. Thanks. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions for the deputant? Okay, seeing none, our next speaker is Anne Curie, followed by Chris Chopic, followed by John Paul Morgan. Do we have Anne in the room or online? Hello, I'm online. Hi, Anne, you have uh, five minutes. Thank you. Um, good morning, councillors, and thank you for this opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Anne Cleary. I'm a resident of Ward 11. I'm also co-chair of Toronto Climate Action Network and co-chair of the TDSB's Environmental Sustainability and Community Advisory Committee. First, I want to say a huge thank you to the staff who prepared this progress and accountability report. This report and future reports are necessary, absolutely necessary, for understanding where the city is making progress and where we're falling short. We need these reports to stay on track and to understand what steps need to be taken when we fall off track. And right now, unfortunately, we are not on track. As the report makes clear, our net zero target is at risk unless, quote, the city, other levels of government, residences, and residents and businesses support and invest in transformative actions that meet the scope and scale of the climate challenge. Of course, our current provincial government's commitment to fossil gas is a huge obstacle here, but the city can still take action to advance and accelerate its sectoral goals. This will require more investment. It will also require more public engagement. And it is the latter that I will address in my remarks today. The report makes it very clear that public engagement is critical. To quote again, the continued engagement of residents and key stakeholders in all of the city's efforts to move toward the net zero path is important for ensuring necessary progress is made in 2024 and that it properly reflects the needs and hopes of everyone who calls Toronto home. So on this, I'd like to make a number of points. First, with regard to this very report, the public needs more time. This report was made public on Friday, giving members of the public, and I dare say councillors on this committee, very little time to digest its findings before the meeting today. The time between the publication of these annual reports and opportunities for the public to respond at this committee needs to be extended. Second, going forward, I would recommend the development of an array of communication strategies to deliver key information from these reports, including graphics, the use of social media, and translation into at least some other languages. If we're serious about engaging the diverse communities in our city to everyone who calls Toronto home and building support for accelerating climate action across all sectors, this will be necessary. Third, Given the importance of public engagement, 
I would suggest that the city's engagement and communication strategies themselves need to be regularly assessed and measured in qualitative and quantitative terms and included in these progress and accountability reports. We need to know, is messaging working? How many people are being reached from which communities? What is the public's understanding of Toronto's climate plan and the steps toward um, the goals and benefits of achieving them? And also, what is the city learning from its communities? Fourth, it was good to see references to a communication strategy with regard to green buildings, but I found no reference to any communications and engagement strategies when it came to transportation choices, unless I missed it. If we are to have any chance of having 75% of school and work trips under five kilometres covered by walking, biking or transit by 2030, six years from now, a focused communications and engagement strategy will be necessary and it too will need to be assessed. Fifth, I'm aware that a youth climate engagement strategy is being developed. However, I was concerned that the report itself made no reference to youth engagement. It is only referenced in the appendices. I very much hope that youth engagement won't be treated as tick the box engagement or window dressing. Youth perspectives, particularly perhaps on transportation choices, are much needed to build the just and sustainable city for them. By contrast, it was great to see the report address the importance of building relationships with Indigenous people and learning from Indigenous leadership when it comes to climate resilience. This is very welcome. And lastly, on the topic of climate resilience, I was pleased to see that there is to be a new role to coordinate resilience planning and action across the city. In pursuing this, I hope that consideration be given to extending this collaborative approach to other key institutions our library system, our community centres and the school boards. I don't thought Libraries, I... community centres and schools are where people learn and create community together, their critical social infrastructure, building a more resilient, climate-informed and engaged Toronto will depend on engaging them. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Any questions to the deputant? Seeing none, thank you for uh, Councillor Sachs. Yeah, and it, uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, recognizing the financial constraints the city has, what's the single most effective thing that you think we can do? I mean, recognizing the research that shows that just giving people information doesn't change behavior. For sure. Um, I really think that there is so much more that we could be doing to work with the school boards. Obviously, I have a particular interest in that. I was pleased to see that there's a new city and school boards committee um, being developed. And I'm really looking forward to the youth climate engagement strategy when it comes out and to seeing how much we can be learning from young people in this city. I would hope that that strategy goes before the city and school boards committee and that it's given some real consideration there. So it has to be both, it has to be two-way communication, it has to be ongoing engagement, it has to be relationship building. And so real attention to social infrastructure, I think has to be critical in climate action, climate justice work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Chopic, followed by John Paul Morgan, followed by Don Moose. Do we have Chris in the room or online? We don't have Chris online, so we saw him earlier. We don't see him now. Okay, final call for Chris online. Okay, our next speaker is John Paul Morgan. In the room? Online? Our final speaker on this item is Don Booth. In the room? Online. Hi, Don, you have five minutes. Hi, um, thank you for squeezing me in. Um, I just wanna talk, uh, talk about a, um, one little part of um, the city's <laughs> environment plan. Um, I've read the annual transform TO net zero progress and accountability report. I'm proud of the city for having such a program and the staff members who shouldered this responsibility. 
it's difficult to work so hard on such an important issue when the results of all this work are not immediately apparent. Thank you. Um, I'm a member of the Toronto East End Climate Collective. We're currently holding a series of seminars on geothermal and district heating and cooling. As you know, pollution from gas that heats our buildings is Toronto's greatest contributor of greenhouse gases. Efforts to replace gas heating with heat pumps have begun to make progress, and I hope that will find the means to increase the rate of conversion. Um, while the province plans to incentivize new connections to gas, I think that the city through Toronto Hydro can provide a much more attractive incentive for builders to use geothermal or district energy instead. Um, why do I suggest these geothermal systems instead of plain old heat pumps that are getting to be so popular? Because the popular air source heat pumps place substantial demands on the city's electrical system. Air source heat pumps are least effective on the coldest days, but Toronto Hydro needs to build enough capacity in new construction to deliver this electricity. And Ontario's electrical generation utilities need to produce enough power, even uh, when this peak demand is only needed for a few days each year. District heating and cooling and geothermal don't have this problem. They're not so spiky. They remain equally efficient regardless of the outdoor temperature. But the trouble is that they're expensive to install, and so that's why we need to amortize the cost. The cost, the IESO, Ontario's Independent Electricity System Operator, estimates that by 2050, we'll need to spend $400 billion to upgrade the grid. It's important to look at the potential savings. Last year, a major US government study compared the cost of geothermal or district energy with air source heat pumps. They estimated a savings of 11 to 13% in electrical generation and a 33% reduction in transmission costs. We can't apply U.S. results directly to Canada, but even a fraction of that savings is significant. You know, a billion here, a billion there, eventually you're talking real money. I'd remiss if I did not also mention that Toronto's Boltzmann Institute is conducting similar research and finding similar results. So if we skip right over air source heat pumps and go right to district heating and cooling or to geothermal, then owners of these new buildings will pay less. That is, these systems are much less expensive to operate. But they're not the only beneficiaries. Every single person who pays a hydro bill will pay less. These systems are getting to be popular in large new developments. If we're resourceful, we can make them irresistible in all new developments. The problem is geothermal and district heating and cooling are expensive to build. We can kind of take a page from Enbridge's book. I suggest that Toronto Hydro can help us here. Using their unregulated subsidiary, uh, Climate Advisory Services, Hydro can offer a low interest rate, and perhaps most important, they can amortize the cost of these systems over 40 years, just like Enbridge's amortization of new connections to gas. Hydro has the financial means to raise inexpensive finance, and it has the billing infrastructure that the program would require. The core of my task is to pivot this powerful tool of long-term amortization from installing gas to installing the most efficient and least expensive systems for heating and cooling new buildings, and along the way to reduce the future demand for electricity. If we're just a little bit creative, we can save money, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and save the planet. <clears throat> it won't hurt a bit. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputants? Seeing none, thank you for joining us. So we'll now move to questions of staff. Councillor Sox. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we heard a lot of excellent uh, suggestions from the public. Um, First of all, in terms of public engagement and particularly uh, engaging students, uh, what are we doing to improve engagement with students and in, in particular, are we using the school board committee? Short answers, please. Through the chair, we are working directly with the Toronto District, 
district school board and we do have a program to engage students uh, as part of our broader engagement. Uh, so there is work underway and we're looking at opportunities to expand that uh, going forward in the future. Okay, when will we hear more about that? Uh, we can report back maybe in one of our future reports, but we can also provide some information offline to those who are yes, interested. Please. Okay. Second, um, the two-stroke engines, we've uh, directed you to go ahead with the ban. You don't mention it in this report. What's the status, please? Uh, so the two-stroke engines is uh, one of the uh, priority actions in the environment and climate work plan for this year, and I believe the direction we have from Council is a report back uh, by the end of the year, so we are working on it. By the end of 2024? That is the, yeah, that's the direction we have to report back. Okay. Um, we heard during the budget process that not a single city division uh, is on track to be net zero by 2040, much less the city as a whole. Um, when will all city divisions have a plan to be able to operate at net zero by 2040? Um, so we are, that work's underway, and, and I'll let uh, Pat jump in as well, but we are uh, developing kind of a, a coordinated approach and framework uh, for city divisions for buildings um, to, uh, to get us on track for net zero by 2040, building on the work from corporate real estate management. I will say quickly, though, that our fleet work, no, so non-building, is on track for net zero by 2040. That's true. The fleets are doing well, but, um, uh, and, uh, Pat, when will we have a plan from you to get all fossil fuel out of city facilities? Thank you for the question, Councillor Sachs, and through you, Madam Chair, uh, to Councillor Sachs. We're currently working on a plan to bring a plan forward for 2025. Um, we're still working with each of the divisions, as you know, working on a centralization strategy to consolidate real estate services over the next two years. Our, our CREMS plan will be more definitive and we'll work with each of the divisions to provide a high level plan and, and, and refine that over the next two years. So by 2026, we'll have a fulsome plan. All right, and you know that we have to have fossil gas out of all of our facilities before 2040. That is correct and that's the plan. All right, um, Lou, Toronto Water, do you have a plan for being net zero by 2040 and why do you keep spending more money on new fossil infrastructure? So we do have energy management plans at each one of our facilities, and we've had that for the past 15 years, and it's been refreshed based on the new policies. Um, with respect to the, uh, the decisions made on capital programs, uh, we embed within the design exercise an assessment of which options to use for power, um, be it uh, natural gas, um, electricity, diesel, uh, depending on what component of work we're doing, uh, that that is taken into consideration uh, by the engineers on what our policies are. Unfortunately, we have to marry up a couple of different policies. We're also uh, tasked with putting resiliency in our system, and Council's given us direction to make sure we have resiliency with respect to uh, dealing with basement flooding. Uh, we move water as, it, um, as the floods occur, as well as if there's power outages, we continue to provide drinking water. So I have to put infrastructure in that does use some energy in order to meet those goals. Uh, so what we try to do is mitigate uh, where we can. Um, but if we take a quick look, we spend about $57 million a year in electricity, as an example. $35 million of that is to uh, pump, treat and pump water into our system. <coughs> 20 million is to deal with it at our wastewater plants, which is typically the biggest component is aeration to deal with the biological breakdown. Um, to offset those is, is quite difficult, but we do have projects underway. For example, uh, we're putting in at the island plant uh, as part of a, an expansion. Um, we're putting in um, a photovoltaic facility with battery backup. Right. Well, my, my, I mean, I'm trying to get on to other questions. Um, I'll get back to you if I can. Um, to Ms. Gray, I understand you've got a congestion management report coming back in October, November of this year. You're willing to include in that an analysis of how we can adjust parking regulations to reduce TTC delays where there's construction sites, correct? Uh, through the chair, yes, we can do that. Okay. Um, and so, Lou, when will you have a plan to be net zero by 2040? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, as I, as I mentioned, we are working through our energy management plans and working closely with the Environment Office on all of the objectives. I don't know whether you could ever hit net zero 
uh, for our operations in Toronto water, uh, seeing as that we are the largest electricity user um, and, and we have to run the utility. Um, the issue will become looking at um, offsets in future uh, if council so directs, uh, but at this point in time, we're looking at mitigation plans, uh, reduce where we can. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Additional questions of staff? Okay, seeing none, speakers to this item. To say it out loud, not just thinking. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sox, five minutes. Yes, well, you're surprised to know that I have motions. Um, so I have two motions. Um, the first is directed to uh, corporate real estate um, that we want to see a plan for actually getting gas out of city owned facilities by 2040. We've just heard from Mr. Matoza, that's not a problem. He's already working on it. But we we need a clear plan that everyone can see. How are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? What is it going to cost? And my second motion is the one that I just uh, discussed with Ms. Gray. Um, we know we've all heard many times that good public transit that is timely, reliable, and speedy is absolutely essential as a part of multiple city building objectives, which includes air quality, climate uh, damage, health and safety on the roads, um, economic development, equity. We need reliable transit. And what we find right now is that our city buses are typically and frequently delayed uh, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes or more because of construction impacts. And when I discuss this with the TTC, uh, they tell me, okay, they recognize they can't do anything about lanes being taken for construction, but then that there needs to be more removal of parking so they can get their buses through. And so um, they're asking that we do more on this, so I'm asking transportation to look at it again, and they've agreed that they can come back uh, in the fourth quarter of this year, oops, fourth wasn't spelled properly, sorry about that, um, with the, uh, as part of the congestion management plan, is to say what can we do better? And then one example in my ward is the important construction being done at the Toronto Western Hospital. We all will benefit from a better surgical tower at the Toronto Western Hospital, as well as them being able to draw their heat from the sewer, but that's taking part of Bathurst Street, and that combined with all the parking on the street is blocking the Bathurst bus, which is a very busy bus, creating massive delays. We, we need to do something to allow the TDC to do its job, and that means they need to have more space on our roads. Uh, other than that, we are in a climate crisis. I know you're all tired of hearing me say this, um, but we are in a climate crisis. We've just been through the winter that wasn't. Uh, we don't yet know what that's going to mean for uh, crops. Are we going to see another failure of the apple crop? Are we going to see another failure of storm fruit? We don't know what it's going to mean for drought and for fires. It looks as if we're in for a record-breaking hurricane season. The price and the cost of climate damage just keeps rising. The city isn't ready, and we're not yet doing our bit. So on both of those things, um, I mean, I know that environment and climate is working hard. Uh, this report shows both that we're working hard and that it's not enough. Uh, it's good that we're starting to think about, well, what are we going to do to cope with all the hammer blows of climate change? Uh, and it's clear that we also have to do more to reduce our own contribution to the pollution, which also means bringing the, the public along. And that's why it's so great to hear from young people. I mean, it's their future that we're burning. So thank you for this. We appreciate it. It's not enough. Do more. Thank you. Thank you. Additional speakers to this item. Uh, Councillor Cole. Yeah, I don't have a motion, uh, but... Uh... I just think there's a real uh, problem here, and that is a failure to communicate. Uh, the public do not appreciate when we talk about climate change. They just think, oh, well, climate change. I think this is bigger than the city of Toronto. We've got to get better ways of letting people know about the catastrophe that's going to happen and is happening. 
and talking about climate change and climate resiliency isn't cutting it. I mean, we need perhaps to bring uh, the Prime Minister Barbados here, Mia Motley. Let her talk the talk. Get her up here, and uh, maybe the climate groups can invite her to come. She can talk the talk about, you know, we're on the highway to hell here, and we've got our foot on the accelerator. That's what's happening. And yet we talk about climate change. That doesn't get anybody's attention. You know, we've got a provincial government that's basically spending $3 billion rewarding people for driving more. $3 billion since 2022 in reducing gasoline taxes and reducing licensing fees. So we tell our city officials, you gotta do more. Well, when are people gonna start to talk to the province and saying, hey, we're working across purposes here. Three billion dollars in encouraging people to drive more. And nobody is challenging that. You know, and I think somebody, one of the speakers, we had a lot of good speakers talked about public engagement is crucial. It's, it is. And right now the public engagement is really failing because You've got then you've got movements across every province in Canada saying we're not going to pay for carbon. They talk about axing the tax. All these provincial governments are getting away with that. We've got one of the federal parties talking about getting rid of this cost of carbon. Yet we're to telling our city officials you got to do more. I think our city officials are punching above their weight. But unless we get a better way of engaging people in a realistic way, you know, we're, you know, maybe the students here from Humber can help us work on this way of reaching people. You know, we're gonna have a billion climate refugees, a billion climate refugees trying to get to a place where there's water and there's food as the sea levels rise and the droughts and so a billion climate refugees. I'm just trying to maybe, I'm experimenting with some of my language here, but we need maybe some new thinking here because our old thinking isn't working. We're losing the battle. And that's why maybe I should move a motion to invite uh, Mia Motley to get up here and talk the talk here because we aren't doing the job here with our tired talk about climate change and resiliency, it's not working. So right now people think, oh well, big deal. Uh, you know, the weather's changing, there's less snow and uh, there's uh, fires somewhere in Northern Alberta. So maybe I'll get uh, uh, my uh, colleague, Deputy Mayor, I was gonna say Motley, <laughs> Amber, uh, to, to basically, let's have a, an invitation. Get uh, Mia Motley up here and talk the talk. Never mind this uh, beating around the bush with all these nebulous terms. Okay, that's my speech, no motion. Okay, thank you, Deputy Mayor Cole. And I know that Councillor Prusa was inspired and would like to speak uh, now. You, well, you know what? <clears throat> when you quote the warden in Cool Hand Luke and uh, in that Southern draw when he says, what we have here is a failure to communicate, right? And, oh. and um, uh, how can you not be inspired by that? First of all, I wanna, I wanna thank our climate office for kind of, you know, sort of wrapping this up for us and always putting it in perspective and, 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 and basically outlining uh, where we're, you know, we're headed in a, in a good direction, where, where things, where we need to do more. And, uh, and I understand sort of, uh, you know, sort of trying to keep all the different departments, you know, whether it's water, it's real estate, it's transportation and others, all on track with this. And if, and if I'd had a question to ask, the question I would have asked was, uh, do we have any idea what, what, um, what this really will cost us, uh, you know, uh, to get to, tw to 2040 and to net zero. And, uh, and do we have the monies and, uh, and do we have the ability to do that? I, I mean, that's, that's fundamentally what I would have asked because when you, when you read through this, when you read through what global warming, uh, where that's headed, 
uh, where, you know, heat events, flood events, fire, disaster. Um, we're, we're not in a good place and we're not, we're not headed into a, into a good place. And I worry, uh, you know, for, for my kids and I worry for everyone else, all the other kids out there. And I worry um, uh, for, uh, for our future. Um, this is, uh, this is a, a tall order. It's a, it's a big uh, a task uh, for all of us. And, and what, we really, what you really need is you need everybody on board here. Uh, it's one thing to say uh, to our staff, do more. Um, and I agree with that. We, ne we all individually need to do far more. But I look at yesterday's provincial budget, for example. Mm -hmm. Right? And, um, and I try to look at you know, um, uh, you know, um, you know, environmental initiatives. I try to look at, look for climate change stuff, and uh, and the rest of it. And unless I missed it, um, there was nearly a mention of it, like zero, right? Um, talk. I guess if you don't talk about something, if you don't uh, uh, point at it, if you don't, uh, you know, mention it, then then. Clearly, it's not a problem, right? Uh, well, well, the you know the province was somewhat silent on it, other than, for example, their ongoing uh, tussle with the feds uh, uh, around uh, a number of these initiatives, and 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 I, and I think the I think the uh, the quote uh, by Councillor Cole in, uh, in 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 quoting the warden in that in that uh, wonderful movie. Uh, 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 with Paul Newton, well, it was a wonderful movie. It wasn't wonderful Paul, for for Newton and some of the others, obviously. But but the quote in there that that failure to communicate, uh, I think, resonates through all of this and resonates through our entire, you know, um, uh, you know, global warming, climate change, uh, you know, carbon infused uh, disaster and. Uh, um, and uh, I, I, I don't know what else you say to that, but I, I, I want to uh, I want to thank the office for for the for the good work that they are doing and sort of in mapping this out for us. And uh, and then really it's uh, it's it's up to us and and our commitments individually and collectively to these uh, to these things that that will get us hopefully to a, uh, to a better place. But like uh, Councillor Cole. Uh, I'm very, very worried that um, that this is uh, way, way bigger than uh, uh, than any of us here. And unless we all sort of, you know, row together here, uh, we're 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 destined for disaster. Thank you, um, Deputy Mayor Morley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you. Um, and to pick up on some of the, the themes from my colleagues, I think it's clear um, to many, to us, and especially through our budget process this past year, um, many Torontonians who participated uh, clearly identified our need to be really strong in our climate action as a big priority for them. Uh, we've heard from young people, and when we're looking at stats related to mental health and what is on young people's mind, what's giving them anxiety, it's it's the climate crisis that we're in the midst of um, and the mess that uh, young folks are inheriting and needing to, to address. Um, so I just wanna really underscore um, my thanks for staff for this great work. I think as was mentioned, we're leading in a lot of important ways as it relates to climate action in the city of Toronto. Um, the, uh, the new Civic Center in Etobicoke is a great example. Um, we've got some really positive coverage and, and conversation around you know, green technology that's being implemented in our own city facilities as we move forward. And I think that work is important. I think it's also really critical as we spent most of our morning discussing garbage and litter and um, this issue around pollution in our city that we not only take action in important policy ways as we're doing um, through this work, but we also ensure that our action is clear to residents and inspiring them um, to take up stewardship of the planet, uh, to take action related to um, recycling and litter. Uh, and I think, you know, when we look around our city and staff know what I'm gonna get into here, um, but I think it's important that we set a tone, uh, that we are really working hard 
to clean up our streets. And I'm thinking of the loose litter. I drive the gardener every day. Um, you know, I'm constantly harping on my team, on, on city staff, uh, about the need for us to demonstrate with our actions um, our commitment to a clean planet. Um, and I think that picking up loose litter, for example, is an important way that we provide a sense of pride, but we also provide leadership to Torontonians uh, as it relates to the stewardship of our natural world. I could go on all day about the impact of you know, de degrading litter into our waterways, into our systems, microplastics, et cetera. Um, and I think if we're not able to, again, communicate our leadership in sometimes nonverbal ways. You know, communication campaigns are great, um, but we need to be doing our work. We need to be ensuring our streets are clean, um, that there are significant and consistent efforts um, to collect loose litter uh, that is in and around our streets. And I think that kind of um, nonverbal communication is the important kind of leadership that we need to continue to take up. So uh, I will leave it at that and just remind folks that we're coming up on April. There's going to be from the 21st to I believe 23rd um, is our sort of clean Toronto together initiatives. We're encouraging everyone to get involved in their neighborhoods, our schools, our students, uh, folks of all ages, um, get out, get active, uh, and the City of Toronto will be along with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think that's it for speakers. I have a quick motion. I'm moving on behalf of uh, Mayor Chow, City Council requests the Executive Director Sure. to report back on existing resources and potential measures for residential and homeowners in pursuing energy efficient and zero renovations, part of reporting on the development of the emissions performance standards for existing buildings in the fourth quarter. Um, and I'll just uh, thank city staff for all of their, their hard work on this. Um, we have a goal, we have an action plan, uh, we have an accountability framework with the, um, the carbon budget and now uh, what we need is partnership, and that's partnership with the federal government and the provincial government. And so all of us need to continue to advocate in that regard for the important funding that we need to make our buildings net zero to ensure we meet our net zero 2040 commitment. Okay, so with that, we'll vote on the motions. Uh, Councillor Sachs's motion, all those in favor, all those opposed, that carries. The motion I'm moving for Mayor Chow. Uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Sachs, a second motion. All those in favor? All those opposed? That carries. And the third, the one I'm moving on behalf of Mayor Chow. All those in favor? All those opposed? That carries. Oh, the item is amended. All those in favor? All those opposed? That carries. Okay, that brings us to the cycling network plan. I think we have nine to 10 speakers. Our first speaker is Adam Kukan, followed by Adam Rogers, followed by Allison Stewart. Ryan, are you in the room, online? Uh, I'm online. Thanks for joining us, Ryan. You have five minutes. Just so you're not surprised that when you have 10 seconds left, I'll ask for final thoughts. Perfect. Uh, yeah, good morning, councillors, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, so I'm joining to discuss Recommendation 1G as a homeowner on Silverthorne Avenue between Roundtree and Rockwell within the Davenport Ward, who uses the street studying on a daily basis. So my first comment relates to the public communications regarding the Silverthorne project, which listed one of the primary goals of the project as increasing pedestrian safety, particularly at the Silverthorne and Rockwell intersection. The proposed and currently favored uh, option two for segment one before this committee puts this goal second to building a bikeway on a quiet residential side street. As many of us have experienced, there's been a dramatic increase in the use of e-bikes and scooters, especially among delivery drivers who generally disregard the rules of the road and frequently use bike lanes. As Silverthorne is proposed to become a major bikeway connecting bikes and e-bikes from Eglinton to Davenport, this new volume of out-of-neighborhood traffic will continue to pose a threat to pedestrian safety at that intersection. I do not agree that building a biking infrastructure on a residential side street is a good idea as this does not align with the project's goals of increasing pedestrian safety in the neighborhood. As an example, the Bloor bike lanes are not built on side streets parallel to Bloor, but rather on the major side street on the major street itself. And within our own neighborhood, the existing east-west bikeways were installed on Rogers Road and Davenport, both of which are, of course, major streets. Uh, why should our quiet street be treated any differently when there are nearby major north-south roads such as Caledonia or Keele, 
with uh, more than enough space to build bikeways on. Lastly, there is currently very little bike traffic on Silverthorne with the most recent census estimating this at less than 10%. Um, project planning members mentioned in the public consultation sessions that they have not studied the current or anticipated volume of bikes or the effects that closing the Rockwell and Silverthorne intersection and changing the direction of streets will have on how this might impact traffic patterns on nearby streets, as well as safety at other intersections. How can the most expensive and most disruptive solution to a problem be proposed without even doing the most basic level of due diligence? Our neighborhood is already subject to terrible congestion at the St. Clair and Old Weston intersection specifically, and we've been without a working St. Clair streetcar for months now. Um, you know, I do not disagree with the multitude of benefits of bikeways for improving cyclist safety and decreasing vehicle congestion and emissions, but I do disagree with their installation on a quiet residential street. Another point on the proposal relates to the fact that the uh, proposed option ignores the needs of homeowners with driveways on Silverthorne Avenue, which goes against the project's goal of retaining local access for residents. There's already a very limited turning radius for vehicles to enter and exit their driveways, given the tight width of the street and parked cars on the west side. By decreasing the width of the street and installing bike lanes parallel to the west curb of the street, thereby pushing parked cars one and a half meters towards the east side of the street, it will be nearly impossible for homeowners to access their own property by way of their existing driveways and garages. This will ultimately force more vehicles to have to find street parking in a neighborhood where parking is already extremely limited, especially during a time when approximately 1,000 vehicles are stolen every month in the city. It will also bring traffic on the street to a complete impasse whenever a wheel trans pickup occurs, which is fairly often given the demographics of the street, um, or if a delivery is made, or when waste pickup occurs. Finally, my last point uh, pertains to an email from the project senior coordinator, uh, Alyssa Serbu, and uh, apologies if I mispronounced that, that directly stated uh, that, quote, public feedback was mixed, end quote, between the two proposed options. If the majority of residents of a neighborhood do not agree with either proposal, uh, why are the staff, especially in the time of city fiscal constraint, electing to pursue the exponentially more expensive and more disruptive option? Uh, why would we suggest that the nuclear option that takes an intersection that currently doesn't even have a single north-south painted crosswalk and turn it into a race pedestrian and bike only crossing instead of making incremental and affordable changes first? What if the better solution to this problem was the quote lighter touch approach uh, known as option one that staff was able to recommend for segments two and three of the project south of St. Clair? I believe that if residents are so divided between the two proposed options, as illustrated by the senior project coordinator, um, I don't see why the city planning committee cannot have gone back to the drawing board and tried to draft a third option with the intention that it could actually gain the majority of the neighborhood support and incorporate public feedback from uh, earlier comment sessions on both of the previously proposed options. An example of this could be to bring us back to the project's main goal of increasing pedestrian safety by closing the intersection of Silverthorne and Rockwell to vehicle traffic without requiring a major bikeway to be built on a small residential side street. Uh, thank you, committee members, for listening to my concerns today. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, our next speaker is Adam Rogers. Welcome, Adam. You have five minutes. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Perfect. Uh, so I'll get uh, right to it. Uh, so I'm speaking today about the uh, the Ward 5 uh, Weston Cycling uh, Project. And now, first, I I am a Ward 3 uh, resident. So the question would be why, uh, why I speak to this issue. Well, I have some bona fides in this area. Both of my parents grew up in the city of York and taught in the city of York. So I'm well versed with this area. But specifically to that location, I used to have the misfortune of commuting from Etobicoke to, uh, to Shepherd and Arrow Road by bike. And I can tell you for a fact that uh, in the winter, my usual path is going along the Humber River Trail was completely inaccessible because it is not cleared in the winter, which means that for one full year, I used to bike over Weston Road and the, uh, the 401, which was probably one of the most dangerous routes I could ever imagine taking it. And I, I honestly almost felt like I was taking my life into my hands. So I'm pleasantly surprised to see the the planned uh, route suggestion along Oak Road uh, to Gary and then up along Wendell Avenue 
under the 401. This will give bikers, when it's completed, a direct route north of the 401 in a safe and protected uh, lane. And I really commend the staff for taking this on. Trust me, If I uh, later on when I found about this route, because there's no wayfinding to find this area, once I found it, it, it made my life and my family feel a lot happier to com when I was commuting north uh, north of 401. But to, this, to speak about the specific route in question, I commend the staff for bringing much needed bike infrastructure to the city of uh, the former city of York in this particular region. There are a lot of uh, there's there's definitely I, th I personally I think there are some improvements that can be made. Uh, one that I brought up to staff and they did uh, offer some suggestions why they didn't go to. But personally, I feel that once the bike lane reaches uh, finishes on Pine, uh, a, a more ideal route would be to to line the bike lane along Church Street to Jane, and then from Jane to Maple Leaf uh, Avenue. Uh, there is a middle median on Church Street that, I mean, obviously that have to go, but if you can remove the middle median on Church Street, uh, you should be able to maintain basically the current state of that street with a bike lane as well. Uh, I mean, I'm sure staff can speak to it, the feasibility, but ideally, I think this would be, if possible, a better option than John Street, which is a, na a narrow, more narrow uh, community street with uh, on-street parking. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Um, one other, uh, but I will say that I'm in support of this, I, I, uh, but I am not a ward resident, so I will obviously defer to the councillor and the people of that area for their, their insight. I did want to raise this as someone who has who knows the area, who's commuted through this area, I know for certain that this is, uh, there are some things that could be fine, fine to tune. And since I have uh, two minutes left, I will mention that I noticed that Trithui is mentioned in the, uh, is mentioned briefly in the Weston report and in our 2000 and, uh, 2022-2024 cycle report, Trithuity Avenue from Eglinton to Jane, uh, sorry, to Denison is mentioned as a bike route, but I haven't heard any updates on it, what what the status of this is or an, uh, or of any uh, goal or, or any plans to get this up and running. I do wonder what's the status of Trithuity, when is, when is public consultation going to start on this, because this is part of the Western connection. Um, and I will say that I think having this connection, especially to uh, then extending it into the Maple Leaf uh, neighborhood will give uh, many students who uh, who don't have the option of, who have the option to take a bike into the, those areas. Anyway, uh, I have, I'll, I'll leave that minute back because I want other people to speak. Uh, I'll stay online for, for a couple of seconds if there's any questions. Great, any questions the deputant? Uh, Councilor Nunziata. Yes. Um... Uh, Adam, um, so you spoke about the median on Church Street. The median on Church Street is traffic calming that was put in many, many years ago. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, you asked a question about Trithui. We are having a public consultation meeting in a few months. Um, and we did have a consultation meetings on the other phases. And as you know, the Mid-Humber Gap was deferred. So that's why we had a huge delay on the Mid-Humber Gap. So just so to clarify, Church Street, the median is traffic calming, which the residents on Church Street asked for. Uh, I understood. Just uh, just a uh, just a quick uh, response, if you don't mind. I'm not I'm not going to disagree. I completely understand. I guess my question is, if we were to reorient the street, uh, to to have a bike lane, could, couldn't that also help for traffic calming? Um, perhaps you could speak to that, uh, well, Councillor. Well, that, that's further consultation. That's a big problem on Church Street because we have a bus route. So I just want to inform Go, you. Duly that. noted. Yeah, duly noted. And I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. OK, um, additional questions, the deputant? Seeing none, um, before we, I'm just gonna move a motion. We're gonna extend to complete the agenda because we will lose quorum at two o'clock. So members will just check in with each other to make sure we have quorum. I know people will step out, have a snack, come back, but it's also to give city staff the, the heads up that that will be happening if you guys also wanna divide and conquer to grab snacks and come back. Okay, back to, oh, sorry, all those in favor, I'll suppose that carries. Um, our next speakers are Allison Stewart, 
Luciana Testa, followed by Matthew Jagiello. So, Alison, you're up next, and you have five minutes. Hello, members of IEC. Um, I, my name is Alison Stewart. I represent Cycle Toronto, and I'm going to focus a bit of my deputation speaking just generally about the need to support Transform TO. The conversations this morning were pretty sober about um, the fact that the city is not moving in the right direction to meet our city's climate targets which will help mitigate the climate crisis we're already in. So we need to make some positive changes. And part of that is extending the city cycling network. Right now, just 4% of our city streets and roads have some form of cycling infrastructure. And if the city is going to meet its target of moving 75% of all trips of under five kilometers, by active transportation modes, which is very realistic and possible, if we give people access to convenient, safe networks of getting around like bike lanes. Um, we have seen with the success of the 45 kilometers of new bikeways that have been installed in the past few years, that that has really generated what can be described as a boom in people biking. That paired with the success of bike share really demonstrates that people are ready, willing, and able to bike. We just need to make it safer for them because it remains the biggest barrier to people biking is a lack of safe infrastructure. Now, as mentioned in the recent uh, climate report, there needs to be a way to accelerate the implementation of bikeways and to do that, there likely needs to be changes to the process, as well as the necessary increases to budget, staffing, and other resourcing. Um, there was also recent discussions about how to improve the way the city communicates with the public to try to get them on board with some of the changes that need to be taken over the next decade. Um, talking about communicating with the public, that shift would help can convey to people the need of some of the, the projects that include installing bikeways, how they're presented to the public. Uh, there should be, for example, no options in the designs being proposed that don't include, include a new bikeway. We, we simply need to expand the network so that people have access to biking. Um, Listening to some of the different um, views on installing bikeways in local neighborhoods, I'm looking at uh, Councillor Morley, who is certainly recently dealing with change in her community, and we applaud her leadership. Um, but we need to find a way to remove some of the political polarization that happens and the views of often the small vocal minority, which tend to represent the local homeowners, which represent a minority of the people that will benefit from the changes. And I'm always surprised when I hear people use excuses such as I won't be able to park my car in my driveway if we add a bike lane, or it's gonna be more um, dangerous for my kids who have to walk to school. When the reality is, when you install bike lanes and build a complete street, you're making it safer for our most vulnerable road users, which include our children, our elderly, and people on mobility devices. So it does not destroy the character of the street when you build a bike lane. In fact, it increases the property values. And so perhaps that's something that city staff can consider in their reports is to add with the implementation of this bikeway, you can anticipate that your property values will increase by X amount. Because at the end of the day, people want to live in walkable, bikeable, safe communities where people can walk to the grocery store or send their kids to, to school without worrying about them getting hit by a car at the crosswalk. So, and that's also why we need to dial up the importance of building equity into our project implementation. The reality is that the bulk of arterial streets reside in our inner suburbs of Etobicoke, Scarborough, and North York. These people have the, few, okay, 
Well, all of that said, please make the process easier for local councillors and for residents and people when we're implementing complete streets. It should be easier for people like Councillor Morley to approve and support bike lanes as well as enjoy biking to where she needs to go. I do recall you riding an e-bike for our coldest day of the year ride and wishing that you had safer bike infrastructure. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Alison. And any questions of the uh, speaker? Thank you, Alison. Uh, the next uh, is uh, Luciano Testa. Luciano, are you here or online? Okay, Luciano, Longe. Andiamo a Matteo Giagiello. Matteo, are you online? Can you unmute yourself, Matteo? Matthew? Uh, yes, hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I'm trying to project my 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 screen, but it's not quite working. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to waste any uh, of your guys' time with the IT issues. Uh, but I uh, just wanted to thank you, uh, everybody for uh, providing me the time to provide our opinions. And when I say our, I mean uh, uh, as a representative of the uh, Wellington community up on Portland Street. I've been living there for eight years and I'm a very active member of our community. I'd also like to give an additional background to myself. I am a commercial builder uh, in the city of Toronto. I've done high-rise work, healthcare work, long-term care, and I also built the 8 million liter thermal storage tank at the well. Uh, I'd like to thank Don, who commented earlier on the district heating and cooling projects. Um, I, I delivered that for you guys, so uh, you're very welcome. Um, what I'd like to uh, address is, you know, I have a very serious concern for the bike lane plans up Portland Street from a community, environmental, safety, and economic per perspective. Uh, from a community's perspective, um, I think it's awfully presumptuous to think that um, you know the, our residents, our local residents, don't know what's good for us. Um, you know, we we obviously uh, came out uh, to support uh, the cancellation of the bike lanes up on Portland, um, and there was a very strong opposition. But it seems like um, the city is moving ahead anyway, which is quite unfortunate. Uh, King and Portland is one of the busiest street corners in Toronto. And it is essentially getting bulldozed to make way for cyclists, which make up 10% of our constituents. Uh, from an environmental perspective, uh, I think we all need to be mindful of the fact that the amount of detours that drivers must take in the area is absolutely absurd. We have to take, we have to avoid left turns. We can't drive straight through intersections. We see that there have been some concessions on the latest proposed bike lane plans up Portland Street, but not nearly enough. It is not a very cooperative plan um, for drivers. Toronto has the seventh worst traffic in the world, according to Bloomberg. And this, this, this issue has increased by 59% since 2021. This adds extra time on the street for our drivers, um, who, again, you know, we, me, myself, I visit my family every weekend in Mississauga. I drive to work, I drive to job sites. I am not an outlier. And we beg you guys to please stop punishing drivers. Um, at a minimum, we would like to request that we lift the restriction on left turns on King Street and remove the proposed diverter at Wellington and Portland. From a safety perspective, we understand and appreciate all these initiatives, uh, but you know there is concern with e-bikes and 
to be quite frank, cyclists don't follow the rules of the road. And there is no plan in place to fix this. Um, if you look at Wellington and Portland where the, where the new bike lanes were installed, they're quite wide. Those streets are not overwhelmingly busy, but only 20% of all the cyclists actually follow the rules of the road. They blow through stop signs, they ride the, the, the sidewalks. Um, again, a lot of these culprits are uh, food delivery drivers, but there's no plan in place to police these people. To demonize, demonize uh, car drivers uh, over safety issues is absolutely absurd. It is a constant anxiety attack walking down sidewalks these days for cyclists just weaving in and out. Um, we appreciate the fact that um, that bike lanes will help keep them in in within the bike lanes, but it doesn't always happen, and there's no plan in place to to help police that whatsoever. You know. Uh, Matthew, can you please wrap up? Tickets, Thank you. Tickets. Please wrap up. Thank you. Another 30 seconds. Well, and then, okay, well, I thought you were going to tell me to wrap up around 10 seconds, but, uh, you know, cyclists do not promote the economy. Uh, uh, the well is lamenting the fact that they cannot get drivers there because it's choked off by bike lanes. We just think it's absolutely absurd, and it's not a very smart decision. We could go about becoming a more green, active community in other ways. Please stop killing vehicles. It's not fair. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthew, for your presentation. Thank you. Next is uh, Andrew King. Andrew is here, or are you online, or are you here? I'm here. Okay, you're here. Mr. Chair and Councillors, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak. Uh, speaking on behalf of both our local association, the Wellington Place Neighbourhood Association, as well as personally for my wife and myself. First point, we do support implementation of bicycle lanes on Portland Street. We have a major concern about the, the lanes being on the west side of the street. There are two one-way streets which come out onto uh, the west side of Portland, and the, um, they will intrude into the bicycle lanes. People, vehicles will have to traverse both the pedestrian path and the bicycle path to be able to make their turns on to Portland. Uh, it's Niagara and uh, Stewart Streets. There are no such comparable streets coming out onto Portland from the east. It would make, from a safety and risk management perspective, it would make far more sense to have the bicycle lane on the east side of the street. And when I was preparing these comments, I forgot to mention, include, there is a major service lane south of King Street that services 2032 uh, Stewart, uh, 66 Portland, and 629 King. It's a very narrow lane, and trucks tr uh, going into this quite often make multi uh, point turns to be able to back into this lane. With the bicycle lane on the west side of the street, it would uh, uh, be right across the path for trucks coming into this lane. Uh, what we see uh, with the Wellington Street bicycle lane is uh, vehicles coming out of the parking lot on, we on Wellington, pull across the sidewalk and the bicycle path and stop in the bicycle path, waiting their opportunity to turn onto Wellington Street. And that is going, if uh, the, the bicycle path is on the west side of the street, it will be a continuous problem at Niagara, at Stewart, and at the lane coming in from behind King Street. Um, the, so, uh, you know, the, 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 there are major operational issues and we would like to see the street uh, we strongly recommend the bicycle lanes be relocated to the east side of Portland. The second topic is the proposed Portland Street vehicle traffic patterns. Um, there were a couple of justifications made. Uh, the Cafe Trio um, restaurants uh, in the King and Portland area, those on Portland uh, either 
Well, they all have boulevard seating areas available. Uh, the um, uh, Maxims on the uh, east side has never used either their boulevard or the cafe TO opportunities, they're strictly indoor. Chica used uh, their boulevard seating area uh, last year a little bit, um, and uh, R Ruby Soho has actually enclosed their boulevard seating area in a permanent structure and they use it year round. Uh, they did have a cafe TO terrace last year, but it was only very intermittently used. We strongly feel that um, the benefit of having two-way traffic uh, on uh, Portland would far, far outweigh the uh, benefits, uh, minimal benefits that are, have been achieved by Cafe TO taking a lane on this street. Uh, the, the benefits for the many should outweigh what we believe benefits for the few. Uh, the justification for tri the driving pattern changes, the one-way street implementation sections and the diverter was to limit infiltration of non-resident traffic into our area. Uh, we've been in the area for 14 years. I've been active with the WPNA. And while we have uh, requested in the past uh, and still have a standing request for a comprehensive traffic pad, uh, traffic analysis in our area, especially given the huge increase in density and population, uh, the, there has not been a proper traffic study done. And, but in the 14 years, there has never been at the WPNA a specific discussion or any really discussion of attempting to limit the infiltration of traffic per se. Noise is a problem, but not the fact that people drive through our community to get to where they're going. So, you know, the, the whole issue of the diverter and the impacts is, is not a material factor to us. It, uh, the diverter itself ha has risks to our community. Can you it, please wrap up, Andrew? Thank you. It, it, it leaves single lane access and exit from a lot of buildings with, uh, in case of fire, in case of police, uh, ambulance calls, blocking any way out or back in for many of our residents. So we would strongly recommend that while proceeding with the uh, bicycle path, it be located on the east side of Portland and that the other traffic changes be deferred until a proper comprehensive traffic study has been done of our area. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, and I'm sure they'll get back to you with that, those uh, very clear recommendations. Thank you. And next is uh, Colin Wood. Yes. Colin is here in person. Colin, you have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, uh, councillors. My name is Colin Wood. I'm a resident of Ward 9 Davenport. I live quite close to the Silverthorne Cycling Connections Project, which I'd like to say a few things about in a moment. But uh, overall, I'm here to express my strong support for this item as a whole. Um, I've expressed uh, two worries I have about aspects of the item uh, in an email submission to the committee yesterday, but I'll leave those uh, to my written correspondence and just focus today on my uh, support. So first, um, strongly su uh, support the continued expansion of the city's bikeway network and urge you to adopt this item. The recommendations align not only with the city's policy objectives, such as Transform TO and Vision Zero, which are important to keep in mind, but also, uh, in a real sense, make a material difference to the people who live in the neighborhoods where the bikeway projects are being implemented. They make them safer places to be a pedestrian. They make them safer places to be a cyclist. They make them uh, nicer places to be. Personally, I'm the, the parent of a young child. Um, safe bike infrastructure makes a big difference to me and whether I feel comfortable uh, using my bike to transport my family. And I am grateful to uh, this committee's support and council's support of the cycling network uh, plan um, in, during this term. In relation to the Silverthorne Thorn project in particular, um, I think it's important to know that in the north end of Ward 9 Davenport, there is very little in the way of safe bike infrastructure. 
We have the uh, Rogers Road bike lanes. They aren't protected lanes, and uh, it often feels unsafe to ride in those lanes because there's often infiltration of truck traffic on Rogers Road, including dump trucks, including uh, concrete trucks. And importantly, uh, the Rogers Road lanes currently aren't connected to the rest of the city's bikeway network. Uh, this project, the Silverthorn uh, project, will do that. And for that reason, I'm, I'm very supportive of it. And in particular, I'm very supportive of the uh, changes proposed in segment one between Rogers Road and St. Clair West, which include uh, the Contraflow bike lanes and the traffic diverter at um, <clears throat> Silverthorne and Rockwell. Um, those changes will make a big uh, difference to improve both pedestrian and cycling safety in this neighborhood. And, you know, in contrast to what uh, a prior speaker on this item mentioned, you know, some of the cycling traffic might be e-bikes and food delivery drivers, which who are entitled to uh, travel on the roads, but there's also families, there's also commuters. We use these bike lanes um, to get around the, the city safely and um, improving the infrastructure really makes a big difference. I uh, would like to express a little bit of disappointment that the, the bottom portion of this project between St. Clair West and Davenport only includes uh, wayfinding changes, which will be sharrows that are painted on the road. Um, I'm hopeful that both this committee and, and staff in the, uh, as this project moves forward into its second phase can consider whether uh, hard infrastructure changes, including uh, perhaps a contrafound bike lane like was proposed, the public uh, consultation stage of this project could be implemented. Uh, but with that, I'll uh, conclude my remarks and thank you for the time and for your, your continued support of the network. Yeah, just uh, thank you that for that presentation. I was just on the, uh, uh, you know, the hydro right away just north of St. Clair that starts at Caledonia and works its way Westerly. Yes. I was just wondering, uh, have they ever looked at doing some kind of uh, uh, bike lane network addition uh, along that hydro corridor? I, I haven't seen anything about that. I, I would obviously have to defer to, to your. I take a look at it if you're ever walking sure. around. It's a good, uh, interesting east west uh, 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 pathway, perhaps. Uh, but anyways, just uh, in passing. But anyways, thank you for your uh, interest and your presentation. Thank you very much. Good luck. Okay, next is, uh, next is uh, Tristan Ridley. Tristan, are you here in person or online? Oh, there. OK, Tristan, unmute there. yourself. Sorry. It didn't let me unmute. It wasn't yeah, we got me you. Until now. OK, you're loud right, and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for the work you've been doing. I mean, I don't think many people appreciate how important the, the cycling network project is for the city's goals. Like we were hearing earlier about how much work we have left on climate change and vehicles are a major portion of that. And if you think electric cars will solve that, we just don't have the capacity to build that many electric cars. We need to have less trips by car. We need more trips by public transit and cycling. Uh, we also, need to we made a promise to eliminate pedestrian deaths vision zero and our climate promises our pedestrian death promises would be broken without a cycling network if you want people to use their bike they need a complete network of protected bike lanes and despite any myths uh bike lanes that are used actually reduce traffic because people who would drive hi uh will use a bike instead as soon as you build me a safe way to do so uh Unfortunately, I'm not here just to thank you. I'm here to talk about Kingston Road. Uh, despite being planned for 2022, 2024, it hasn't moved forward at all, seemingly in three years. Uh, there were some valid excuses at various times, but I want you to pretend for a minute that you live in Southern Scarborough. Uh, plan yourself a route to the Danforth, it's right there, uh, or to downtown. Uh, stick to routes that are safe enough that you would risk your children. If that's even possible, how far do you have to detour? Uh, my cousin lived in West Hill. She could get, do it, but she'd have to go through uh, North York. Um, Kingston Road is the only direct route from Belton Scarborough to downtown. And right now, there's no safe connection for us to that wonderful complete street uh, that's on the Danforth. I have not been able to use any of the cycling network because I live in Cliffside. Um, this planned route 
uh, Danforth Kingston is the backbone of the Scarborough cycling network. And pretty soon we're going to be talking about the next phase, the 2025 and on. Uh, there's proposals or candidate routes on Midland or Brimley or McCowan, and those will be stubs, not part of a co cohesive network, which means they will be underused, means they will have to fight just to keep those open. A network is only as strong as its weakest link, and the link across southern Scarborough right now is entirely missing. Uh, I said I've, I live in Cliffside, which means for me it's more than just bike lanes. Uh, yes, I did. I bought a bike and a bike trailer, and then I discovered afterwards that we were almost completely cut off by bike. Um, you have to ride on a very dangerous road uh, or the sidewalk illegally to get to anywhere uh, or take some stairs. So, but for me, it's more than just the bike lane. There's a complete street project, and Cliffside has so much potential that is destroyed by having a dangerous highway cutting the neighborhood in half. Kingston Road is too loud, too fast, too dangerous. It, the current design is an anachronism. It has more in common with an expressway than a city street. Literally, we have a highway interchange just west of me, 300 meters away from Cliffside Elementary School. Uh, and that road capacity, all it does is pushes more cars more quickly into already clogged neighborhoods in the beaches in Danforth. I want to ask each of you, why is this essential project not moving? When are we, as a community here, going to get our chance to express our support? I talk to my neighbors. I go to the bus stop and I talk to them about this. And everyone I speak to, everyone I speak to says, is very excited. I mean, they're not driving at the time, but everyone I speak to is very excited. And right now, it feels like Scarborough. We're being left behind again. And... It honestly feels like this project has been quietly cancelled. And given how important cycling is to all of our goals, abandoning this project would mean abandoning the concept of a citywide network and practically mean abandoning Vision Zero and Transform TO. And that does not feel like something that should be done quietly. So thank you. I'll see you the rest of my time. Thank you. Are any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, our next deputant is Ella Wind. And then our final deputant on this item is Lynn Adamson. Do we have Ella in the room? Online? Hello. Hi, Ella. Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Thank you so much. Hello, IAC members. My name is Ella. I'm a resident of Scarborough Junction, and I use a variety of means to get around my neighborhood and our city. I drive, I take public transit, I walk, and I take my daughter to daycare in a bike trailer. Uh, I want to first thank the IAC for your commitment to advancing numerous projects in our city, including delivering many components of the 2022-2024 cycling network plan. But as we advance towards the end of that plan, I cannot help but notice that one of the projects, the one most important to me and my neighbors, appears to have stalled with no answers as to what has happened, and that's the proposed Danforth Kingston Complete Street. Right now, Danforth, east of Victoria Park and Kingston Road remain the dangerous, loud and unpleasant roads that they have been for decades. Kingston Road is effectively a highway cutting through our community, even though it could easily become a socially and economically vibrant main street for Scarborough, which we now lack. We don't have anything akin to what the Danforth is for all of East York or what Bloor Street West is for Swansea. Just as an example, my daughter takes her weekly dance classes on one side of Kingston, and even at the crosswalks, I do not feel safe to walk with her across that wide, fast-moving street just to pick up takeout at the restaurants that I can see on the other side of that street. The Danforth Kingston project proposed not only protected bike lanes, but also comprehensive safety and business enhancements and making the pedestrian realm a pleasant and safe place to be. Yet despite the excitement expressed by many in our community, Scarborough has once again been left behind on what was supposed to be a flagship project for our area. Spring 2024 is now here. It's going to be Easter weekend, but we have not yet had a public consultation, let alone any signs of an installation. And no one will tell us why. It will be impossible to hit the cycling network's 100 kilometer target or the major citywide cycling routes without this Danforth Kingston Complete Streets project. 
This is a project of citywide significance, not just major significance for Scarborough. I have a simple request for this committee. Please continue to champion safer streets for all of Toronto, not just for the downtown. Please ask staff for an update on Danforth Kingston at today's meeting and find out what the next steps are for making sure we reach our goals for installation this summer. And if the city is not going to reach the targets that we were promised, we in Scarborough deserve to know. We deserve to know if this project has been quietly canceled, if it's been delayed, we deserve to have an update. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, our final speaker on this item is Lynn Adamson. Hi, Lynn, you have five minutes. Thank you. Um, I'm speaking for Climate Fast. We always support bike lanes and we are really grateful for the progress the city is making in expanding the cycling network. Uh, but that said, it's just simply not enough. What's happening is too slow. Uh, it needs to be accelerated. I will just say a little more about where I live. I live at Toronto St. Paul's, Eglinton and Oakwood. Uh, and so I have the benefit of, I think it's a, a one-way bike lane on Vaughan Road. Um, so that is what I use. But I really avoid um, a street like Bathurst where it's quite dangerous. So I'm always looking for the safe routes where I go. And I just can't um, applaud enough the comments that we need, that, that the network is only as strong as it weak, its weakest link. And I really um, empathize with people from Scarborough because they seem to be particularly neglected. So I, I really hope that we will uh, act as quickly as possible. As I spoke in our earlier deputation, we need to accelerate in order to get the shifts um, in transportation patterns in order to reduce our emissions, um, we need to shift. Um, I also want you to, to think about the fact that the health benefits are enormous for people if they're able to cycle safely. And that is so important because people will not cycle if it isn't safe. And it's safe means for seniors like myself and also for children, also for new cyclists, people who are not already um, skilled cyclists. And this is perceived lack of safety is the primary reason more people do not cycle as a method of choice. I know that you need to consult, and I, I'm glad that our um, city staff consulted to, to look at um, problems or changes that might be needed in a particular area, but it's really important to pers persevere and get the actual bike lanes in place where they're needed. Um, so I'm going to speak and behave on, on behalf, sorry, of 150 kilometer um, with, within the years 2025 to 27, rather than the six kilometer that we're having in the current um, plan at the moment. Um, and we need to complete 500 kilometers of major citywide cycling routes. Um, I wanted to mention that many cities around the world have expanded cycling infrastructure and they have happier streets, safer streets, quieter streets, more people-friendly streets. You know, Paris is a fantastic example. And I just really want to see Toronto go that direction as well. I'm grateful for Cycle Toronto's uh, comments on this and all the deputants. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Um, we will, oh, sorry, are there any questions, the deputant? Okay, are there any questions of staff? Okay, seeing none, I know Councillor Nunziata needed to leave and patiently waited. So um, I just asked the committee if we can just um, change the order, just let her speak quickly before she heads out. So go ahead, Councillor Nunziata. Thank you. And I believe, Madam Chair, that you do have an amendment for me. Um, this is on the, um, the Pine Street uh, for the, uh, for the uh, cycling, uh, plan that's in my ward, which includes Pine Street, and that's uh, phase one. Um, so we did have a community meeting, and um, there, um, there, there were a couple, a few residents that had some concerns on Pine Street. And I know that the staff has uh, spoken to the residents, and their concern was um, the, lot, the we were going to eliminate the parking on Pine Street. So the motion that you have 
which was drafted up by staff, and thank you for moving that on my, on my behalf, um, addresses the issues from the residents that live on Pine Street. And um, as it was mentioned earlier, that uh, the deputy that spoke about Trithui, and I know that that public meeting is coming up shortly, and we're going to meet with the residents. And uh, the other the other phase is um, uh, there is some work that the city is doing on these on the streets. So I think the the other phase would be delayed until these uh, the city does the infrastructure work on these particular streets because you don't want to do put the infrastructure in and then the city comes in and they're doing road work on the streets so um thank you for moving that amendment for me madam chair and that's all i have to say thank you okay so um we'll move back were there questions of staff Okay, motions um, and speakers. So, Councillor Sachs, did you have any motions? No? Okay, I have some motions that I'm moving on behalf of other councillors. So, um, the first one is on behalf of Councillor Nunziata, and this is uh, um, for Pine Street. The second one. is on behalf of uh, Deputy Mayor Malik, who's joining us here. And then the third one uh, this one is on behalf of Councillor Thompson. And I know that I think Councillor Pasternak has one. No. No. He's not, okay. Uh, so I think that's it on speakers. And we're just gonna hold for one minute for quorum because Councillor Cole is talking to the media. Um, I know that, I don't know, Jacqueline, if you can comment to those three. I know, I know they all three of them worked with you on those, right? Um, they did, correct. Um, through the chair, Councillor Nunziata's motion is in order to maintain um, some additional parking spots along the route. Um, so there is a, a change to the bay bikeway design to accommodate that. Um, and the motion from Councillor Malik is to, um, to Deputy Mayor Malik, apologies, that is to sort of address more um, monitoring um, after implementation to understand the impacts because there are a number of changes to circulation patterns in the area and we want to make sure we got that right because it is quite complex um, as well as some impacts on some um, potential impacts on other streets in the area um, and the third motion is from Councillor Thompson um, asking us to investigate a sidewalk The Pine Street motion is that, well, but we're still getting the bike lane, is just a change in configuration? There would be a bike lane on, through the chair, there would be a bike lane on one side and a shared lane on the other. We are comfortable uh, for one block. Uh, we are comfortable. We also have um, several phases of this project, so we'll work um, through any challenges after implementation if we observe any main issues. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, great. Additional, sorry, we were on speakers. Did you want to speak? I, can I ask one question of staff? I'm so sorry. We'll just open, sure, go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to um, follow up on something we heard from a deputy today. Um, they asked about having all cy cycling infrastructure on the east side of the street when it comes to the Portland and Dan Lakey corridor. Can you just uh, quickly comment if that was examined uh, during the study and what the outcome was? Yeah, thank you. Through the chair, we did um, review the potential for the east side. We agree that reducing any conflicts for a two-way bike lane on one side is really important, but there are a number of developments, other driveways, loading, and Cafe TO conflicts that we did end up going to the public with options, but all with west side uh, two-way bike lanes. Mayor? Um, 
Thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak at the committee, um, particularly on the Portland and Dan Leckie corridor, um, and how important it is as a key north-south route, south route that connects Queen to the waterfront. It's also a route that cuts through one of the most dense areas in the city, which has seen and will continue to see construction and development projects. To accommodate that level of density and vehicle traffic, the city has to do its part and provide infrastructure that will reduce construction, con that will reduce congestion and cut through traffic, as well as provide safe cycling and pedestrian options to sustain the neighborhood's growth. And over the last five years, there have been over 20 reported collisions at the Portland and Wellington intersection alone. And I've heard the concerns about the need for improvements and the cycling network plan offers a solution that also addresses our concerns around traffic safety. I also heard the concerns about the pressures that the traffic calming and flow changes may bring. And I'm committed to working with the community and city staff to have an ongoing evaluation and openness to adaptations of the cycling connections after installation. This is why I'm really grateful that Deputy Mayor McKelvey is moving forward a motion on my behalf requesting that Transportation Services conduct an analysis of the new configuration after a standard review period and look at the potential impacts on Front Street, Bathurst Street and Spadina Avenue to see if further work is needed and what changes might make a big difference in our community. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And I really want to thank, um, really, with so much sincerity and, and so much respect, the work of residents on this proposal, their tremendous engagement and care to get this right. I want to make sure that we also extend a lot of gratitude to the staff who have been working on this item and making sure that our cycling network is as robust, as useful, and as adaptive as it needs to be as our city grows, and making our city streets a safer place for drivers, cyclists, and pedestrians alike. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Last call for questions or speakers. I know we kind of mixed and mashed on there. Okay, that's it. We'll call a vote on the motions. So this was the first one for Pine Street. All's in favor, all's opposed. That carries. I'm not on this committee. Uh, motion for the Dan Leckie Portland cycling connections. All those in favor, all is opposed. That carries. And the third one is on Howden Road. All those in favor. All those opposed, that carries. Item is amended. All those in favor, all those opposed, that carries. Okay, so that brings us to the under Gardner public realm. Um, we have four speakers. Our first speaker is Sam Carter Shemai. Okay, thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Great. Um, thank you, committee, uh, and everybody for being here. I'll try to get through this real quick. So my name is Sam Carter Shamai. For the last three years, I have been working with the Bentway team and a whole host of city staff on developing this plan. I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. The Undergardener Public Realm Plan is a visionary guideline. It's a roadmap for how to improve one of the most iconic, complex, and expensive infrastructure corridors in the city of Toronto. Despite the many many debates about the future of this elevated highway. And as we, the public, are spending billions on the roadway itself, there has been little discussion or even consideration of the condition, the experience, the safety, and performance of the spaces below the drip line, under the shadow of this highway in the sky. This plan is about transforming a single purpose highway from the 1950s into hybrid infrastructure for the future. The gardener is often derided as a barrier between the city and the waterfront, but on the ground, for the tens of thousands of Torontonians who live, work, or just want to spend time at all along this corridor, the real barrier is the hostile and uncared for condition of the 60 plus acres of public space underneath the gardener. Throughout the process, when I would ask people over these past many years, what do you think about the spaces under the highway? The first and most common answer was something along the lines of, I don't think about it, which is telling. When pressed a little further, most everyone agreed that there is room for improvement. It can be better. This plan, the Undergardener Public Realm Plan, sets out a vision and strategies for how we might start working towards that better state. 
better in terms of safety, environmental considerations, identity and wayfinding, access to amenities, and this many destinations along seven kilometers of the corridor which stretches from Dufferin to the Don River, the shoreline stitch has, be, has been identified in, in past pre, uh, policy documents. The plan itself, to, to summarize, outlines two sets of recommendations, what I like to call the what's, a set of new baseline features that are explicitly not cited, but recommendations of the types of features that could improve the spaces below the gardener, and the where's, identification of specific opportunity sites. Again, not prescriptive of what needs to happen there, but highlighting the key places where interventions would have most impact. I'd be happy to speak to more specifics if the committee would like to ask questions, but with my remaining time, I want to speak to how this plan came together, which, in a, in a word, is through collaboration. I have a few concluding points here that are basically shout-outs and lessons that we've learned from the many departments, industry experts, and collaborators who played such important roles in bringing this all together. I know that public service can be thankless, and so as I wrap it up here, I want to make sure that we do give thanks. We recognize, again, the many, many hands that have, and minds that have gone into this work. So to start, I want to thank my immediate team of young, mostly black and racialized planners and designers, without whom this work would not be what it is. It's Jane, Galela, Jess, Faison. I'm proud and reassured to know that there are such hardworking, dedicated, and principled minds working towards the future of our city. Secondly, I want to thank the leadership of the Bentway team, um, Alana, Dave, Robert. I want to thank leadership from the city, Deputy Mayor Malik, and others, because it reassures me again that this is not just me like shouting into the wind here. This is about our city. And we've heard through consultation, through hundreds of conversations, through surveys, feedback from all sorts of people, even in the press, there's a, a piece in the Star recently, which I'll paraphrase the, the headline was, but if we're going to keep this, this gardener, if we're going to commit to the gardener, let's make it as good as we can be. Again, it's not just me talking about this. We need to do better. Um, again, not just we need to, it must. We, we, we have to do better. Anyways, the, yes, this report is specifically about the undergardener corridor, but the notion of hybrid infrastructure is something that is playing out across the city, from the Medway to the Davenport Triangle, to Rouge Park, the Don Rue naturalization, the Portlands. I want to here give a big thanks and shout out to all of the staff and city servants, civil servants who are con contributing to this movement, the leadership from so many departments, transportation staff, TRCA, Waterfront Secretariat, Parks, Work, History and Recreation, Economic Development, I could go on. I feel like we worked with pretty much everybody on this work. Um, Last point, second to last point, I think the hardest part about this work is consultation. It's difficult, but it's so important. If we are truly committed to an equitable and inclusive city, one that is really committed to enacting the calls for truth and reconciliation, to confronting with safety and compassion the reality of homelessness in the city, we need to understand the public realm and we need genuine more than consultation, collaboration, and that can only move at the speed of trust. This requires, again, ongoing commitment over and above beyond the constraints of project deadlines. This is an everyday task that we must carry forward together. Here I want to thank, again, list of folks, Matthew Hickey, Fred Martin, um, um, consultants and artistic collaborators that we worked with throughout, the staff and service users of the shelters and respite centers, particularly folks at Homes First and um, the again, collaborators we've worked with through Sketch Working Arts, and, and among many others, for helping to reinforce and learn these lessons. Um, and finally, this is from myself, um, I want to thank you all here at committee for listening and for your ongoing commitment to a better city. A city is not a spontaneous accident. It's not something that just happens. It is a reflection of our collective priorities and choices. The plan, as I conclude here, is not about a sudden change, is not about flicking a light switch, but this is a long-term, generational commitment. At the same time, like all long journeys, it begins with a single step. And as I have learned of all collective efforts, the work is best done when all of us, city staff, political leaders, 
private sector, nonprofits, community members work together. So with that said, we'll wrap it up. Went a little bit long. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there questions of the deputy? Um, outside councillors first, any? Okay, uh, Councillor Sachs. Hello, Sam, great to have you here in front of my committee. And I know you've been working on this a long time. Um, yes, it's a long process, but talk about the short run. What changes are possible in the short run and what's the next step to make it? One thing that I really like, thank you for asking, is that throughout this process, we haven't been waiting to test out and trial ideas. Our whole sort of process, and this is borne out in the existence of the Bentway itself, is that we sort of test, trial, and iterate as we go. So there are a number of pilot projects that have already started. I would point to the corner of Dan Leckie and Lakeshore Boulevard at the recently opened um, staging grounds installation. This is a demonstration of many of the principles that we're talking about. Increased access to public space, rainwater runoff, use, using runoff from the, the highway to remediate, uh, create gardens that can remediate the, the, the water. Um, seating, again, access. Um, so I could point to collaboration we did with uh, the waterfront BIAs and the downtown West BIAs at York and Simcoe, looking at how to improve pedestrian safety at those intersections through, again, a combination of demonstration projects that use artistic interventions to, again, engage the public, make people think a little bit more about this space. Um, there, in the plan, again, there are about a dozen uh, sites that we have identified as ripe for opportunity. I, I think that the idea here is that with this roadmap in, in hand, all of the relevant partners, be they, again, public sector, private sector, or otherwise, who are adjacent to working on projects already that interface not only with the quarter, but specifically at those key zones, can start to draw on this, this, this set of tools that we've provided to, um, to make sure that we're working together. It's not just an ad hoc, one-off approach, but that together we contribute to a cohesive vision and bit by bit, we can move ourselves forward to, to, to achieve that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, additional questions? Thank you for coming. Our next speaker is David Carey, followed by Ilana Altman, followed by Kevin Sio. We have David up first. Okay. Uh, so then Ilana Altman. Ilana Altman followed by Kelvin Xiao, followed by Alison Stewart. Thanks you for joining us, Ilana. You have five minutes. I have a presentation. Is somebody able to help yeah, me? Yeah, they'll, they'll come help you set it up. Members of the committee. Sorry, they just need you to pause for one second. I think we just lost the feed, so they're just going to put it back up.
Okay, sorry, we're live again and uh, the clock has been reset. You have five minutes and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Members of the committee, my name is Ilana Altman and I'm the co-executive director of the Bentway. And on behalf of the Bentway, I want to thank you all for having us here today to share our work on the Undergardener Public Realm Plan. I also want to acknowledge Deputy Mayor Malik, who's in the room today, who has been following this process uh, throughout, and we're incredibly grateful for your ongoing guidance and support. Um, I must echo uh, Sam's uh, lovely remarks, uh, acknowledging the many staff, city staff, Bentway staff, and designers who all contributed to this process and informed the recommendations before you today. The, under, the Gardner Expressway runs for about six and a half kilometers in an elevated state across Toronto's downtown core. And while it serves a very important mobility function above, it has long been a barrier at street levels, at dividing communities from one another and dividing uh, Toronto's city to the north from its waterfront to the south. When the Bentway opened in 2018, it aimed to bridge these barriers at grade by creating new connections across the Fort York neighborhood. And over the last six years, we've seen how transformative these improvements can be with residents in the greater city alike Embracing the space as a backyard park, a new cycling trail, and a destination for recreational and cultural activities. But the Bentway in its current state represents just a small portion of the elevated ex expressway. And over the six and a half kilometer length, there is numerous opportunities to continue to improve the public realm beneath the highway. If we stop seeing this solely as an expressway, solely as a mobility corridor, we start to recognize this as a really important civic spine with the ability to connect so many different civic priorities, including transportation hubs, uh, cultural and recreational destinations, and neighborhoods. It's with this opportunity in mind that the Bentway and the City of Toronto began a collaborative effort to develop the public realm plan, uh, drawing upon both planning and engineering expertise as well as on the ground learnings. This report represents a really unique collaboration between nonprofit and the public sector and one that I think there is tremendous learnings that can be gained from. Uh, we're incredibly grateful to the numerous city divisions who we worked with closely in the development of these recommendations. Our primary study area runs between Dufferin and Young Street, recognizing the great work that had already taken place to the east with the Lakeshore East Public Realm Plan. Um, and within that primary study area, we focused on five distinct districts, each with their own character and uh, unique neighborhood makeup. I won't go into this in great detail because Sam spoke to it so eloquently, but um, we are incredibly grateful to the numerous uh, uh, people across the city who contributed to our consultation efforts, was, which was extensive throughout the duration of the project and which remain ongoing. The Bentway is really committed to continuous uh, consultation through our ongoing program and advocacy efforts. Um, and together we can continue to inform the future development of these recommendations. As Sam mentioned, there are two primary uh, recommendations that come forward. The first is the new baseline, a set of features that when applied across the corridor can collectively help to enhance the safety, connectivity, predictability and performance of the undergardener spaces. These features include new recommendations around pedestrian lighting, consistent wayfinding, stormwater management, new resilient planting strategies, um, walking and cycling trail strategies, as well as many others. And because so many stakeholders, both public and private, are involved in the delivery of these spaces and improvements, we recognize that working with a common palette, working with a, a common set of features to be applied will help to achieve the connectivity that we are all aiming for, as well as a consistent character to the corridor. Additionally, there, uh, as Sam mentioned, there are numerous uh, site-specific opportunities that we've identified in the primary study area some of which are new cultural landmarks that could be delivered to help tell the story of Toronto. Others are high performance landscape improvements uh, that can help uh, with our climate readiness and resiliency. And others like the Bentway itself are, offer the possibility of new destination based public spaces um, that can help to unite the communities in the downtown core. Though the plan includes many new recommendations and design strategies, it aligns closely with stated city plans and policies and advanced shared strategic goals of removing barriers to the waterfront and making new connections. And you can see a list which is, is um, not entirely comprehensive of all of the city plans that we reviewed in very closely and aim to align with. 
In closing, uh, there's a huge opportunity to see this mobility piece of infrastructure embraced as a new hybrid piece of infrastructure that can reflect the values of the city we have today rather than those that were um, reflective of the time in which the structure was built in the 50s and 60s. And we hope that um, we can answer any further questions that you have about the plan uh, and about the benefits that we are looking to achieve. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Uh, Deputy Mayor Malik. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alana, and, uh, and to Sam as well for both being here today, um, for the presentation, for the comprehensive work, for the incredible public engagement with stakeholders that has gone into it. And so just as we look ahead to the implementation of this plan, there are a range of opportunities for funding and implementation. Um, could we hear a little bit more about the precedent that the Bentway has created around mobilizing resources and fundraising for projects like this um, that are on city lands and in partnership with, with the city? Yes, happily. Um, as many of you know, the Bentway was made possible by a transformative private donation uh, by the Matthews family, which enabled this incredible public space to come into being. But it, it is very much representative of uh, a shared agency and collaboration between public and private entities, which increasingly we are seeing as an important way forward for the ways in which we uh, fund and continue to improve our public realm. And there's huge opportunities to build upon this model. Uh, the Bentway is a nonprofit, an independent charitable organization, and we continue to fundraise for our ongoing operations um, year over year, and have seen tremendous uh, results um, and support from uh, government uh, entities at all levels, as well as uh, the private sector, in terms of helping us to keep that space animated and available to the public. Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining us. We Oh, sorry, uh, Deputy Mayor Morley has a question as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, um, thank you for the great work. And I'm just curious, as we, those of us who come in from West End, um, coming across the Gardener, obviously there is significant work continued um, to be planned for the Gardener. Um, and I'm just curious how you all are coordinating with staff to ensure that um, improvements are being made after the, you know, working coordination with staff around some of the ongoing work, maintenance work at, on the Gardener. Well, it was really uh, that timing in mind that prompted the development of this plan, recognizing that there was a major investment that was taking place into the Gardener's future and that there was an opportunity to align public realm uh, improvements and investments with the planned work. We're working really closely with transportation services and engineering and construction services to better understand the ongoing maintenance uh, needs of the structure. And you'll see those, um, that feedback reflected in the recommendations. Fantastic, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing no further questions, thank you for joining us. We have two additional deputants on this item, Calvin Xiao. Do you have Calvin in the room, online? Hi, Calvin, you have five minutes. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon, community members, and thank you for allowing uh, me to speak today. My name is Calvin Xiao, and I am the uh, Chief People and Strategy Officer at Exhibition Place. I am here on behalf of Exhibition Place to express our support for the Undergardener Public Realm Plan. The Exhibition Place grounds, as you may know, um, and the surrounding area are in a transition period with numerous infrastructure projects in progress or the planning stages. As we revitalize the site, there are opportunities for enhanced pedestrian and cycling connections and collaborative planning to promote the adoption of complementary uses between the Bentway and Exhibition Place. The core of this will be supporting the increased movement of transit users and pedestrians through the adjoining northern access points under the Gardener. Exhibition Place has recently completed a multimodal and logistic study. As stated above, the pressing need for our study is the expansion of transit through the northern gateway under the Gardener. The study's goal was to better understand how to develop this emerging entryway onto the onto exhibition place and improve connectivity for non-vehicle users, as well as provide flexible uh, use for goods and movement and event logistics. The under Gardener public realm plan recommendations were incorporated into our study results. I want to commend the Bentway 
for their vigilance in ensuring um, exhibition place staff, community members, and stakeholders were consulted throughout the engagement process and, and kept updated. It is reassuring to see the commitment to innovation, sustainability, connections, and community-centric design. The public realms, uh, guiding principles of safety, ecological stewardship, connectivity, active transportation, and cultural enrichment align with our Exhibition Place strategic plan. Exhibition Place supports the undergarden public realm plan and hopes that the committee will do so as well. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Uh, Deputy Mayor Malik. Um, thank you very much, uh, Kelvin. Thank you for your deputation. And to you as well, thank you for the ongoing work on the comprehensive planning for exhibition place as a destination and strengthening the connections uh, around the site and especially um, as we see reflected back in this plan. Could you talk a little bit more about the immediate opportunities you see on coordination uh, with the Bentway with um, you know the added uh, have to have an undergardener plan? Yes, one of the things that we're working collectively with the, the Bentway on is the connection under Strawn uh, that connects um, the Bentway to exhibition place. Um, there are some obstacles in the way um, currently, which uh, the primary one is the substation that's being built for the um, for the subway. So once we understand what that looks like, we can navigate through it and um, and make that connection. The other barrier is the uh, streetcar tracks, and I think we're working very closely with them to try to design something where where it's going to be safe, but but pedestrians can cross. Great, thank you. Any additional questions? Okay, uh, seeing none, our final speaker on this item is Allison Stewart. Hello, members of IEC. Um, by way of an introduction, my name is Allison Stewart. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Public Policy for Cycle Toronto. Um, Cycle Toronto wholeheartedly supports the under Gardner public realm. Uh, the collaboration between the city and the Bentway really is a world-class showcase of how designing our public spaces for people benefits the vibrancy of the city at large. Um, this represents an immense opportunity to improve and expand the active transportation network that will connect more people safely and comfortably to the waterfront, the exhibition place, and the city. The Bentway is as much a destination as it is a connection. It's really a successful car-free space that offers a range of diverse programming to, that caters to you know, a diverse group of people that make up our city. And it's really the kind of transformation we need to see more of, especially in the areas that are chopped up by the expressways that cut above and through our communities. Um, in terms of finding ways to communicate the value of investing and implementing infrastructure that improves our city's public realm, that's designed for its walkability, cycleability, and community gathering, the Bent May really provides an excellent case that should be shown for all of these public projects to really show a before and after photo so people can really see and help understand what the vision is and that the world will become a better place. Thank you for your support. Thank you for all your work. Thank you, Deputy thank Mayor. Thank you. Uh, questions of Deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you for joining us. Questions of staff? Uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you very much. Um, so my first question is uh, just uh, requesting an outline of how the recommendations in this plan were reviewed by staff for alignment with city plans and policies and programs uh, so as to build them out, it's how, so as to build on them and to build them out. Through the chair, um, thank you for that question. We started and ended with the city policies and programs um, when the advisory committee met with the different divisions and the Bentway, we went, we presented as all the divisions our various um, programs and policies, and we worked with those policies um, 
through throughout the whole process and incorporated them in the public realm plan. So the public realm plan really reflects uh, the policies and plans that uh, Alana presented earlier, like the uh, Lakeshore East Public Realm Plan, um, the Lower Young Precinct EA, the city's official plan with, with the uh, Central Waterfront Secondary Plan and the downtown plan, especially the Shoreline Stitch, which um, embodies all these ideas of connecting the city and the downtown to core to the waterfront and uh, the public art strategy, uh, the complete streets guidelines and transform TO zero net strategy. So um, this, is, this has been something that, uh, and when we have uh, specific recommendations with the implementation plan, we'll further develop the work with those policies. Um, I have an, just two additional questions. Um, this is picking up a little bit on the question that was raised by Deputy Mayor Morley. Um, can you advise on how the province has been made aware of the scope of this report and if any objections were raised? Through the chair and thank you for the question. Um, so given the Ontario Toronto New Deal agreement and the proposed upload of the Gardner, we did consult with the province um, to make them aware of this report. We shared, shared the Bentways um, plan um, with MTO staff and, and, uh, and indicated that preserving the proposed public realm and programming as part of the upload is a priority for the city and there were no concerns communicated. And my final question is just um, about the Interdivisional Advisory Committee. Um, can you outline what output this Interdivisional Advisory Committee will provide on the implementation strategies for the plan? Uh, through the chair, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, we'll be working on a, on a framework for implementation that will be a bit like a three-year rolling plan. So a rolling plan of projects where uh, year one of the plans, the projects will be built into City of Toronto capital budgets, um, and then we'll also be securing, you know, hopefully outside funds. And then as, you know, as each year is completed, we'll be adding a third year. And that's to allow us to remain nimble, to respond to opportunities, uh, whether they be funding opportunities or, fun or opportunities related to construction, uh, th aligned things that are happening and so on and so forth. Um, we will report back in 2025 on this. Uh, the timing is a little unsure at present, but we'll, we'll certainly get started with the implementation committee um, as soon as possible this spring. Great, thank you. Uh, you can, but Councillor Pasternak put his hand up first. So Councillor Pasternak, uh, questions followed by Councillor Prusa. Great. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So on, on page five, there's a December 31st, 2024 date. Uh, now, is that a target date for handing over complete control of the gardener and the DVP to the province? Uh, through, uh, through the chair, uh, jean louis Saab, Deputy Chief of Staff for Intergovernmental Affairs and Agency Relations in the City Manager's Office. Um, so the target of 2025 is, is the date where the upload is expected to be completed. That's correct, Councillor. Well, this says 2024. The end, the end of 2024. Right. So I know that we had about $500 million in let contracts um, when that agreement was struck. Um, has the province agreed uh, to, to assume those? So through the chair, um, as part of the new deal, the province is uh, funding uh, those contracts that are currently underway for 2024 and then if the new deal for whatever reason if the, if the due diligence isn't completed by December 31st 2024 they've also committed some funding to 2025 to enable us to continue with those works as well but yes we fully expect that um, once the upload occurs that those contracts would transfer to the province now when it comes to um, what's underneath the uh, gardener, and that's the main subject of what we're talking about uh, today, um, the public realm plan under the gardener. Um, will that, will, will the land proper remain municipal uh, if, if the upload is successful? Or that subject? It's a parking basement sale. It's like the cheapest sale of the property. 
His turn. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can we control some of the members here? It's getting a little robust. I do have a gavel. We'll use as needed. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that counsel. Um, so through the chair, we don't yet know um, whether it will include the land under the gardener or not. Um, we have, as David indicated, communicated to the province the importance of the, the Bentway and the space under the gardener. Uh, so those will be discussions that we will have over the next year as, as we discuss the upload. What, what are the chances of this becoming a provincial park? Um, what if they start asking for that? Or that's the hypothetical, we'll leave, we'll leave that for now. So on, on the final page, this is a very unruly meeting. Thank you, Councillor Pruitza, can we please let <coughs> Councillor Fastback finish? So and then you can uh, last question on page 10, um, it looks like you're looking for, um, for more money um, in the last paragraph, next steps. Um, now we've received a $25 million donation uh, and we have a conservancy and the whole concept of conservancy is it can raise, raise private money and then manage, manage the project. Um, there's no mention of section 37, which the, the downtown is quite uh, flush with. Uh, is, this, is this project, and I, and I have this a wonderful report here, is this project starved for cash? Uh, through the chair, the uh, the project isn't started for cash. The, the the project is not yet funded because we don't yet have an implementation plan. But it's it's assumed that as projects are identified, some of them will be very aligned with uh, current and planned city capital spending, whether it be through PFNR or economic development and culture or transportation services. In addition, we'll be looking to other uh, levels of government. The Bentway may uh, be in a position to raise additional funds. The BIA may be in a position to contribute funds. So it's a partnership model that we'll, uh, we'll hopefully be able to make use of as we, uh, as we consider implementation aligned with capital budget priorities. Has, has the 25 million been depleted? Uh, through the chair, the $25 million was for Bentway Phase 1, uh, which was built between 2018 and I think 2021, uh, and it is uh, currently being operated uh, by, as, a, as a public facility. The answer seems to be yes. I think the, I think the answer is yes. So, okay. So I have other questions, but we'll leave them for council. Okay, thank you. Although I will realize you have more time if you need it because you were interrupted several times. <laughs> Councillor Prutza, would you like to ask questions? <laughs> oh, well, you know what? <laughs> he, he, Members he that we lose quorum at a, 2 o'clock. He, he touched on a nerve that I'm very, very sensitive about. I, and you all know how I feel about, uh, you know, the sort of the, the fire sale, uh, you know, for the gardener and the DVP to, and, uh, and us sort of, you know, fire sailing it to the province for nothing. Um, I, I, so, I, I, I would assume, um, and and I don't know how this is going, but I would assume that at the at Great Gardener, uh, they get the land as part of the highway. Um, I, I, I I imagine there isn't a strata agreement that's going to like. Who who understands what uh, how how the conversation with the provincial government is going? Who who has information on that? Is it the guy that was on the on the on the thing, the inter governmental affairs guy? Were, were you the end of it? So through the chair, there were two people in the room who, who were involved in those discussions. There's Jean from the city manager's office, and then there's myself from transportation sure. services. So, so at, at grade, are, like, is that like a, some kind of a strata uh, uh, agreement they get over? Councillor Prusa, can you just speak in the mic so it can get picked up on the feed? Is it, is it a, a strata thing, or did they get the entire, uh, the entire right of way? from fence to fence. So through, through the chair, as, a, as I indicated, Councillor Pasternak, we haven't got to that stage of the discussions yet. So exactly what constitutes upload of the garden or the DVP has not yet been defined. Right. Like, uh, here's where I'm getting at. Like if we ever need to like punch a sewer line underneath it, uh, north to south, we are the city after all, right? Uh, do we then have to go cap in hand and pay for that 
uh, for that uh, for that crossing, or or are we going to? Uh, that's just okay. You know what? That's a rhetorical kind of facetious thing, right? Uh, so, so now when the where the gardener begins to rise above grave, right? Uh, have, have, has anybody done any work on what the foundations look like underneath the garden? Is it a continuous foundation, or is it, or are they like, you know, you know, posts in the ground? I would imagine they go like really deep into the earth because you got water there, right? Like that was built right next to the lake, right? So this is like, I, I would imagine that those uh, um, columns holding up the gardener are probably going like I don't know, 20, 30 feet deep because back. In the 50s, you know, they, they didn't have construction. To, they don't. It's not like a floating footing, right? Continuous, underneath. In which case, you'd have to cross anyway. In which case, I suspect that the conversation we're having here today about this thing is moot because it just goes nowhere, right? Does anybody know the answer to that question? Is it a floating footing, or are they pylons that go 30 feet into the lake? Through, through the chair, my understanding is that they're piles. Right. Correct. The, the, bent, the bents are uh, sitting on piles. Piles, so okay. And, and, and I would imagine that those columns now, when they hit the ground, they widen considerably. They almost like touch each other because those footings become very wide and very deep, right? Through the chair, you can see where the, uh, where, where the bents hit the ground. Sure. Um, you can see where, where they do hit the ground. Um, and, there is, and they widen, but under, underground, underground they would be wider Yeah, still, underground right? they'll widen. Yes. They're wider still. Yeah. yeah. yeah so. So when you when you take the one on the south and you take the one on the north, I suspect at some point they almost touch each other there, right? Like in in the middle. Right? I would imagine that that they would. So have I just to... want to remind the member we're not talking about the design. Like back and, to the bent way. The point is the point that I'm trying to make here is is that you you, you it's like anyway, forget it. Yeah, sure, sure. Just give it away. Just like give it away for a nickel. Like without offering it to anybody else, you know, so that 10 years from now, the province can reap the tolls on both, right? And turn them into like, you know, cash machines, right? And let them take the benefit of that. Thank you. Okay, so Bingo. Okay, so firstly, I just want to remind people we have five speakers after this and two more items. Okay, speakers, Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you very much, and thank you again to the committee um, for your deliberations and, and questions on this item. Uh, we know that the Gardner Expressway is one of Toronto's most significant pieces of transportation in infrastructure, and as a transportation corridor, so many use it right across the city. And beyond that, as we heard every day, many people experience it as a built structure that divides neighbourhoods and business districts from one another, from one end of the city to the other. In our collective task, as we looked ahead to the years of upcoming gardener rehabilitation, was to plan a new kind of infrastructure that meets the needs of a vibrant and growing city, a plan that takes underutilized areas and makes them do more as welcoming, accessible, and inclusive public spaces. And that work has already begun through the efforts of so many, as we heard today. In the east, the Lakeshore uh, Boulevard Public Realm Plan will transform the area from Lower Jarvis to the Don Valley as the gardener is rebuilt in the area. And in the Fort York areas, the Bentway Project led the way for a transformation of an unwelcoming area into a cherished public space. And these successes pointed to the potential and the importance of a corridor-wide vision that could tie together the undergardener spaces through a coherent and consistent plan and planning mechanisms and implementation. A vision that met the challenge of considering the many varied conditions under different areas of the gardener. And with their experience and ingenuity, the Bentway team was positioned to guide this conversation in partnership with the city across many divisions and to create an extensive review with the public, with neighborhoods, with business associations, property owners and agencies and beyond. The recommendations that provide new baseline conditions for the corridor and site-specific projects represent what is needed to make the undergardener a truly complete public asset. As the undergardener plan shows, the opportunities are many, 
Enhancing connectivity through safer, more beautiful intersections and pathways advance our goal of breaking down barriers across the undergardener. It opens the potential for activations and programming that are the creative energy of planners and artists and creatives who can use the unique conditions of each site in unexpected and much needed ways. And these plans also continue our work to develop resiliency and ecological integrity as a city through its rainwater management and planting strategies. All these efforts will make the experience of visitors and residents and businesses connecting between the downtown and waterfront something can be, that can be enjoyed in and of itself. Underlining all of these recommendations is the, is the work that has been done by the Bentway and city staff to align these proposals with existing city plans, pro, uh, policies and programs, and to build on them. The Bentway and city staff also brought this plan, this plan their experience, brought to this plan their experience from developing protocols for implementing projects within an environment that requires close coordination with the requirements for maintaining the gardener as transportation infrastructure. These practices have been learned from and will continue to expand. And as we work on the uploading of the gardener to the province, I know the importance of continuing the development of the public realm will be a priority for the city. A new relationship and coordination will be developed with the province as recommendation, recommendations come forward for the implementation around the corridor. The recommended interdivisional advisory group of staff will provide the review of the priorities and implementation strategies that will continue to advance this work as part of a comprehensive review on how to address the implementation. I am recommending the general manager shelter and support services be added to the team to inform discussions on these plans. And I have a motion that I'm grateful for, to Deputy Mayor um, McKelvey for moving forward. I'd like to just end by thanking the Bentway team for their leadership in guiding this proposal to a plan, to the city staff from all divisions that have collaborated on this work, led by the Waterfront Secretariat through Heather Inglis Barron, and the many members of our communities, the public, businesses, neighborhoods, agencies, property owners, and stakeholders right across the city that gave their time and their input, their expertise, and their care for this project into this process. And I'm looking forward to the next stages of work and our work together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any additional speakers to this item? Councilor Peruzza. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that, uh, that this beautiful plan um, is at some point doable. But here's my trepidation that our conversations around what can happen uh, in and around the gardener and the DVP, if we go through with the fire sale to the provincial government, is that all those conversations basically get taken off the table. All these wonderful ideas, I suspect, become victim of that fire sale. Um, why do I say that? Well, because, because as Councillor Malik just indicated uh, and, and just spelled out, the importance of these arteries that run through our city uh, and their importance to city building. I know that all of us have had this sort of a lengthy conversation about what to do with the gardener for a long time. So we finally decided we we're gonna take down a portion of it and move it over. Another portion, uh, I think during the Miller, uh, um, uh, Miller administration, we actually took it down. Um, now, whether I agreed with that or didn't agree with that, I believe that what was important about all of that is that we were able to have that conversation here and make those decisions here because they were related and connected to city building. That's what that conversation is about, city building. The minute you, you, you do this fire sale, why do you think the province jumped all over it? Because Doug Ford wants us to come out ahead on anything? Seriously? Does anybody around this table really believe that we got the, the upper hand in that deal? I, that we got the benefit of that deal? We got the best 
Uh, I'll tell you why you didn't get the best part of that deal. Because I suspect that we had, if we had put that out to the market in some other form. Uh, Who's gonna buy it? Well, uh, but we didn't test it. Who's gonna buy it? Why don't you propose it? I'll support that motion. Thank you. you. you Sorry, Councillor Cole, it's Councillor Proof. You haven't time to speak. And, so, and again, I remind you, we have to adjourn at uh, two. But, 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 but I, don't, I, don't mind the, I don't mind the engagement. Um, I, I, I just simply want to say this. I, I just think that this is like a, a real, real bad mistake for us. I believe that ultimately uh, these highways will be uh, told. They will, uh, they will, um, We're not you know. About the deal. We're talking about doing something underneath the deal. Well, you're not going to be able to do anything underneath We're the deal, okay. I suspect. We're okay with it. Well, I don't know if they're going <laughs> to. Uh, the deal bugs me, Madam Chair, and I'm able to, to talk about the gardener because that's what we're talking about, are we not? <laughs> although, although, although I really do appreciate, I, I really do appreciate my, my good friend's comments. I, I, I just simply want to say this. I hope that it dies in the details. I really do. I hope that the details ultimately save us on this. I hope that uh, that you know the, the the easements and the ownerships and and the foundations and the crossings and the underneath and the and the above ground and all of that stuff uh, and and the ramps and the connections uh, and all of those things ultimately uh, uh, kill this because I think that for the city of Toronto going forward imagine. Imagine us turning over the 7,500 word, uh, the 7,500 kilometers of roads that we have in the city. Why, why pave those? Why shovel the snow on all of those? Why don't we just, you know, say uh, to the province, "Hey, take all of our roads. You take care of them. You know, like, you know, repave them, shovel the snow, take care of the sewers underneath, and all the rest of that stuff." Why don't we do that? That's okay. that's a big cost to us, is it not? Oh, it's, it's not. <laughs> I see. I, I, we should stop spending any money on Wedgwood. Okay, no more asphalt on Wedgwood. No more fixing potholes on on Wedgwood, and and then see if uh, if uh, if my good friend. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Yeah, so, um, uh, that's that's my uh, that's my little rant on that. Thank you. Uh, I have a motion just on behalf of uh, Deputy Mayor Malik, just adding in as she spoke to the general manager of Toronto Shelter and Support Services. Uh, we'll vote on the amendment. All those in favor? Right. All those opposed, that carries. Item is amended. All those in favor? Right. All those opposed, that item carries. Thank you for your patience waiting uh, for this item to come up today. Okay, we have uh, five speakers. Um, I'm going to propose we go through all the speakers because then if we lose quorum, these two items will just go to council without Rex, which is out, not ideal, but at least then the speakers haven't lost their opportunity to speak. Our first speaker is on Major Snow, uh, Alison Stewart. Uh, following Allison, we're going to move to the speakers on uh, the new item by Deputy Mayor Morley for project design for Superior Avenue. So the speakers are Andrew Vander Vanderwall, Jan Vanderwall, Alex Cameron, and Eric Vanderwall. So we'll go through all five speakers first. Uh, go ahead. Great. Hello, Allison Stewart from Cycle Toronto. Um, I'm here to express our support for the ongoing work that is being done on the city's major snow event response plan. Um, and really, we'd also just like to reiterate the importance of making sure that both cycling and pedestrian infrastructure is maintained throughout the year. Um, and that when we talk about safe and passable um, snow clearing for bike lanes, it must be bare pavement. Um, and so really would like to thank Councillor Diane Sachs, who brought forward um, an item at IEC titled Bike Lanes That Are Safe and Passable for Bikes as a way of really ensuring that not just the uh, separated cycle tracks are cleared bare to pavement, but that all bike lanes, including painted lines and the contraflow lanes, because those are used throughout the year and that will encourage people to maintain their active transportation throughout the year. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Are there questions on the deputant? 
I see none, thank you. Are there any questions or speakers on this item because it does not go to council so we can uh, leave now? I'd like to move the item. Okay, all those in favor, all those, yes. yeah. I know there's no snow this year, what do you got to talk about? So this item does not go to council, so we do need to do it, and we have four speakers, so go ahead. Okay. Just want to confirm that I have your commitment to update attachment two so that it properly shows that cycle tracks are, or cycle lanes are required to be 60% bare pavement. Yes, uh, through the speaker, we will do that. That's in the contract amendment. We'll be happy to bring it forward, and we'll bring it forward in July when we bring our first annual winter uh, report. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. You'll be followed by Jan Vanderwall, by then by Alex, then by Eric. Thank you. Go ahead, Andrew. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Council Chair and Committee members. Uh, thank you very much for uh, hearing us out. Uh, my name is Andrew Vanderwall. I'm a resident on Superior Avenue. I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Can Hello? hear you. Yes, OK. Um, um, we're having a bit of connectivity problems. I'm hoping everybody can hear me. Um, uh, we uh, residents of Superior Avenue have um, uh, belatedly learned along uh, uh, with other uh, residents of a, a 2023 City Council decision to um, install a physically separated baller protected cycle track on Superior Avenue. And uh, this is a decision we were not consulted on, and uh, nor does it contain the road safety measures that we have been requesting for the past nine years. And again, I'm having connectivity problems. Can people hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, very good. I will continue then. Um, back in, and I'll, I'll, I'll be as brief as I can in the interest of time. But I do want to mention that uh, going back to 2015, we uh, we created a petition for traffic calming in our neighborhood because we had learned that where it requested by the councillor or were 25% or more residents to be in support, that traffic calming, including reduced speed limits, could be introduced to certain priority residential streets in our neighborhood. And we took up the initiative back then of creating a petition with over 150 signatures to um, uh, representing streets used by drivers as a shortcut uh, between the arterial roads of Royal York and Lakeshore Boulevard West. And, uh, and that submission went to, um, to the councillor uh, at the time and staff of transportation services. Uh, very little has happened since, but we, uh, the point is we've been requesting traffic calming and road safety on our streets, our residential streets, uh, for many years. Um, now, the first thing that we saw um, um, years later was the uh, Mimico Mobility Plan, which we're very happy to see initiated, and we were participating in it. And it was through the participation of that mobility plan that we learned that, uh, that there was already, in May uh, of 2023, a report by Transportation Services entitled Cycling Network Plan 2023 Cycling Infrastructure Installation Third Quarter Update. And that report uh, identified Superior Avenue for advanced measures due to impending road work. And this recommendation was passed before City Council, uh, passed by City Council less than a month later on June 15th of 2023, without consultation with affected residents and, uh, and in isolation from measures being considered under the Mimico Mobility Plan. Now, the Superior Avenue residents were very surprised to learn of this decision only two months ago, literally just as construction was about to begin. So not only did we not get the road safety measures that we've been asking for for years, it is because we did not get these road safety measures that we are now looking at getting a cycling track. So needless to say, we were rather um, consternated by all of this. And we immediately created a petition that was signed by virtually all residents on the proposed cycle track section of Superior Avenue, both collectively and through the petition, uh, through the petition as well as individually, residents have expressed many concerns to Councillor Morley and uh, city staff relating to what was slated to be installed. And um, our key points, and I'll go through them uh, uh, quite quickly here because there were many, but the key points is that it, the originally approved measures for Superior Avenue do not appear to be consistent with Vision Zero. They, they did not include traffic calming measures for the benefit of all vulnerable road users 
who, as we know, include pedestrians, school children, older adults, cyclists, and et cetera. And were the current plans implemented, in fact, we believe that all vulnerable users would continue to be as vulnerable as before, if not more so, more so including the cyclists. And I, I, I say that as, uh, as I am also, uh, in addition to being a resident of Superior Avenue, an, an, an avid cyclist, and both on road and mountain biking. And commuting from my Superior Avenue residence to downtown Toronto through all seasons, which is a 12 kilometer each way trek, I've been doing that for over 12 years and clocking about two and a half thousand kilometers per year, just, just cycling in Toronto. So um, we, um, we uh, uh, put forward that petition and, uh, and identified that uh, instead of um, uh, creating uh, uh, such barriers, that we create a traffic calm uh, road that is safe for all, all road users. Thank you. Final thought. Now, um, my, our final thought here is where we, uh, we went recently with Councillor Morley, and Councillor Morley has consulted with city staff and came back with a solution that has the cycle path demarcated by painted lines rather than curbs and bollards. And Councillor Morley indicated that there would also be a process for looking at installing additional traffic calming measures that we have long been requesting, including speed humps. Thank you. Now, the design... Thank you. Yes, That's okay. 520. Okay, our next speaker is Jan Vanderwall. Hi, thank you. Um, we are in support of the um, new recommendations coming from staff and for, from Amber Morley, but I also wanted to speak on the fact that I am imploring the City Council and all staff to look at getting rid of plastic in its infrastructure. The plastic bollards uh, are problematic and we know that plastic is an issue for the health of the planet and all living beings on the planet and city council needs to take a lead on this the federal government wants to declare to plastics toxic and is having too much of a foot pushback from uh, the big oil and gas industries and this is a place where city can council can take a lead we see these plastic bollards are broken and laying on the street, ending up in our sewer systems and in the lake, and the even proper recycling of plastic is not a good idea. It is only downcycled a couple times. Sorry, I, I see that. Should I st pause for a minute? I see that uh, d plastic is only downcycled a couple times before it all ends up in landfill. The city needs to take action and stop in the plastic in its infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, and apologies. I was just asking people who had questions later. Um, Alex Cameron, uh, it's your turn. Do we have Alex online? Hi there, uh, my name is Alex Cameron. I also live on the uh, impacted part of Superior Avenue. Uh, I believe that the changes suggested in the uh, March 20th proposal are a step in the right direction, and if I have to, I can reluctantly support them. I, if I felt the time allowed, I would continue. Sorry, I'm just starting my video. Um, I would continue to advocate the, the approach laid out below for Superior Avenue, and I encourage you to consider this approach even at this late date. I agree that improving cycling infrastructure is a key part of Toronto's green strategy and that a workable, broadly supported green strategy for Toronto and all of Ontario is critical. However, I firmly believe that we need to improve cycling infrastructure without being perceived as conducting a war on residents or a war on cars. We need to create win-win scenarios where all road users and residents benefit. We need to create allies on our green journey, and we need to avoid creating enemies. I think that my proposed details below improve safety for all concerned while not penalizing the residents or the local businesses. I think this is how we create allies, not opposition. I believe that the ideas I'm outlining here can scale to apply to all residential streets in Toronto. I see this as a way to move towards a greener mixed transportation mix in Toronto, and I would encourage the IEC to discuss this approach as a generalized solution and apply this thinking broadly across residential neighborhoods across Toronto. My proposal, leave bar parking on both sides of Superior Avenue, consider 
implementing a parking pass. In my opinion, it's fair to ask residents to pay for the privilege of street parking. Put up signage making it clear that bikes have the right of way and cyclists are entitled to use the full lane. Use paint and signage to indicate that bikes share the traffic lane on an equal basis with cars. Change the speed limit to 30 kilometers per hour and improve the signage about the speed limit change, including a flashing speed limit sign. I reviewed Section 214.1 of the Tra Highway Traffic Act, and that leads me to believe that you can declare Superior Avenue a community safety zone, which then allows AS. E, uh, automated uh, uh, speeding enforcement, that's per section 205.1 of the Highway Traffic Act. So, uh, declare a community safety zone and include the uh, community safety zone signage as well. If I'm wrong about being able to declare a community safety zone, then get to work with the province to fix the legislation. Use ASE frequently. If you have the statistics to say it's warranted, make the ASE permanent. Direct transport uh, services to work with the province to define the characteristic for automatic stop sign and excuse me for automated stop sign enforcement. Once the required legislation is in place and the required technology has been sourced, install it. Install red light cameras at Superior and Lakeshore. Put in place measures to collect data, which can be used to validate any future changes. As Matt Cook states, it's better to solve existing street safety issues through design rather than enforcement, although enforcement always plays a role. I agree with that statement and would add that the change to user behavior is the real key. I think with the correct use of signage, road markings, and enforcements, we, we can make get the desired change in behavior. Thank you for attention to this. Thank you for your deputation. Um, and for joining us today. Our final speaker is Eric Vanderwall. Do you have Eric online? Yes. Uh, Eric, we need you to unmute. Yes, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now, thank you. Five minutes. Thank you. Um, Hello, good afternoon, and uh, I'd like to start by saying thank you for the opportunity to speak on this item um, today. Um, I'm speaking in support of the proposed changes to the cycling infrastructure design for Superior Avenue. I am also a cyclist. I cycle both recreationally and have previously commuted for several years downtown. And so I am fully supportive of, of expanding the city's dedicated cycling infrastructure. Um, I've also been a Mimico resident for 30 years, having lived on Superior Avenue for 12, um, and I've only just recently moved outside of the city. Um, for some context on this issue, um, nine years ago, residents first submitted a petition for traffic calming for a number of streets in this area, including Superior Avenue, to address community safety concerns relating to the increases in cut-through uh, traffic, uh, both speed and volume, um, which appeared to correlate with the rapidly increasing density of the adjacent Humber Bay Shores area, as well as just a general increase in traffic congestion in the city. Um, this uniquely situated neighborhood creates a few inviting shortcut opportunities for impatient drivers who exit the eastbound uh, Gardner Expressway ahead of congestion. Despite um, this near neighborhood-wide petition, uh, which has now culminated in the form of the Mimico Mobility Plan, uh, which is now reaching its final stage of review, we were shocked to learn that a physically separated cycle track on both sides of the street had already been approved uh, completely out of step with the Mimico Mobility Plan. Uh, we were dismayed to learn that the primary rationale for the cycle track which required physical separation from traffic, complete with precast concrete curbs and dozens of reflective plastic bollards, was due to the high speed of traffic on this residential street, without any design elements oriented towards slowing traffic levels to, to a, a level where physically separated cycle tracks would no longer be warranted. To further add to the dismay of the community, that these safety concerns were still not being addressed after nine years. The proposed cycle track 
would result in the elimination of all on-street parking from both sides of the street, where many narrow, old, mutual and shared driveways only accommodate a single vehicle. This directly and disproportionately penalized residents for the actions of speeding cut through traffic and not the cut through traffic itself, which was allowed to continue unencumbered without any traffic calming or lane narrowing through the original design and would force residents to now have to cross this street with uncalmed traffic speed so dangerous that it warranted physical separation for cyclists after parking their cars elsewhere in the neighborhood. In the absence of any community consultation prior the, to this approval, we have only subsequently had the opportunity to work with Councillor Morley and city staff to raise our concerns about the original design's inability to address traffic related safety issues for all vulnerable road users identified in Vision Zero and not just cyclists through, through this physically separated de design, which um, no doubt well, well meaning, I do not believe was appropriate for a residential street. I strongly believe that the revised design is not a compromise, that this design, which focuses on reducing speed of cut through traffic with lane narrowing and future traffic speed humps, while providing dedicated space for cyclists is to the benefit of all road users, including pedestrians, local motorists, and cyclists, and is a proportionate and appropriate form of cycling infrastructure for a residential street and a family neighborhood. I would just like to conclude by thanking you for your consideration on this matter and for thanking the councillor and city staff for working with us and meeting on site to discuss this revised design. I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, and I see no questions, so we'll move to speakers. Deputy Mayor Morley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, um, moving the uh, letter before you all with respect to the recommended design changes in this stretch of Mimico, as was mentioned from the deputants here today, um, there was a little bit of a cart before the horse uh, situation that had happened and a lack of consultation with affected area residents. Um, I just want to thank my staff, my incredible team for their due diligence and their work um, with staff to staff in transportation um, services as well. Um, those leaders this important work to come to a solution that still works for our um, vision uh, of safer streets for all road users, while also taking into consideration um, some of the very significant concerns um, related to this particular stretch. So I thank you all in advance for your support, um, and again, look forward to um, the implementation of the revised design uh, for Superior Avenue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I'll just quickly thank Deputy Mayor Morley, one, for her brevity right now, um, but also for her leadership and listening to her residents and bringing this forward before us today. Uh, we have 30 seconds if anybody else wants to add anything. We'll call the question. All those in favor, all those opposed, this item carries. Thank you. That's a wrap for the meeting.